This is the Wednesday, May 24th, 2023 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Uh, Wheeler. <laughs> I forgot my name already. <laughs> After six wow. and a half years. Here. <laughs> we'll now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good at it. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. And finally, for testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, a couple of quick announcements. We have a lot of important people in the audience today. Are the aardvarks in the house? Yeah. All right, we have the OES aardvarks in the house. Welcome, <laughs> thank you for being here. And we have the Rose Festival court here today, and we'll get to them a little later. Um, and so uh, welcome and thank you all for being here. First up is communications. First item is number 396, please. Uh, 396 request of Perla Estrada to address council regarding community-based organizations wage advocacy. Good morning. Perla here. I don't think they have arrived. All right, we'll move on to the next individual, please, 397. Request of Jessica Mathis to address council regarding community-based organization wage advocacy. They canceled their request. All right, we're moving through these very quickly, 398. Let's see if we get luckier. Uh, request of Pia Johnson to address council regarding United Nations sustainable development goals in our region. Welcome. Thank you city council members for this privilege of speaking to you today. We are the fourth graders from Oregon Episcopal School. We are here to talk about advocacy and to advocate for something we think is very important to our city and our world. Advocacy is standing up for something we think is right or you think can make a difference. As fourth graders, we have heard from and visited advocates in our city, such as Black Futures Farm, who have advocated for food sovereignty. We have learned that advocates use tools like writing and petitions and letters to show people what is right or what needs to be changed. Advocates can also use art or protesting. One more important part of advocacy is using empathy to understand many perspectives. All advocates raise their voice like we are doing today. There are many changes we could advocate for, but today we are here to talk specifically about plastic pollution and plastic recycling. Earlier this year, we went to Camp Westman on the Oregon coast, and we spent time on the beach. All around us, there were pieces of plastic on the ground. We couldn't even take off our shoes because there were so many pieces of plastic. It ruined the experience of the beautiful beach scene. While we were there, we picked plastic up off the beach as an act of service. This mosaic was created from the beach plastic we found that day. But we didn't want, just want to take care of the plastic that ended up on the beach. We wanted to think about how to stop plastic from getting to the beach in the first place. We began researching the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
the SDGs are goals that the United Nations has put together for a sustainable future for everyone by 2030. We first heard about the SDGs from Western Farm Workers Association, another group of strong advocates in our city. There are 17 SDGs in all. Each fourth grader researched an SDG and an issue affecting our region. We put on an advocacy symposium for our school to educate them about the goals and issues. Because of our experience at Camp Westwood, the whole fourth grade learned about the Regional, Camp, Regional Consumption Production SDG, which includes plastic production and plastic recycling. Now today, we want to advocate for how our city can help us all reach this goal. We want you to know that we are trying our hardest to make this problem better, and we really need your help to change how the city of Portland manages plastic. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I just wanted perhaps. Sure. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Pia and Abigail and Desmond for their um, testimony today. Uh, you did a great job of highlighting why advocacy is important. Um, you also did a really important job of um, highlighting a specific issue that this council should pay attention to. And also, I, I want to reassure you, later on this afternoon, um, or maybe even this morning, um, this council will take up an ordinance which um, helps clarify and improve the systems that we use for plastic recycling. Uh, so I want the kids who testified today to know that we heard you, uh, um, we agree with you, and we're moving forward on the priorities that you care about. So thank Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we, we have more, correct? Very good. Yeah. All right, uh, item 399, request of Desmond Overbeck Gear to address council regarding United Nations sustainable development goals in our region. Welcome, thanks for being here. Good morning. You have heard from our peers about why we began to investigate plastic. Next, we want to share some of the research that shows why this is an important issue to the city of Portland. It starts with how plastic is made. The process of making plastic takes a lot of effort, money, and time. 99% of plastic is made from fossil fuels, which need to be extracted from the earth. After they are extracted, fossil fuels go through an intensive process until finally small particles called nurdles are formed. These are smaller than a pea and are shipped around the world to make plastic products. Right from the start, the environment is impacted. Drilling and transporting of oil and gas can cause oil spills. Fracking can cause earthquakes. Toxins are released into our atmosphere and liquid waste can flow into rivers, lakes, and oceans. Once plastics are produced, much of it ends up as waste. Just since we've been speaking to you, one million plastic bottles and nine million plastic bags have been thrown away. Can you believe it? And where does it all go? 79% goes to landfills. Some plastic, like the plastic in a water bottle, can take 400 to 1,000 years to decompose. 12% of plastic waste is burned, which has very harmful side effects. 9% is recycled. Why so little plastic recycled? Some recycling plants do not accept all types of plastic. Also, if plastic is not washed out, it is not accepted. Did you know that 1,000 different animal species are harmed by our plastic pollution? Plastic can be found in 9% of seabirds' stomachs because fish eggs and noodles look almost identical, so seabirds often eat noodles. Plastic in the ocean even gets into the very beginning of the food chain. Filter feeders are animals that eat by straining little particles out of the water, and this can include microplastics. The plastic moves up the food web from these filter feeders. If no improvements are made in our plastic production and recycling efforts, by 2050, there will be more plastic in our oceans than fish. The plastic problem is a global issue. More than one quarter of the world's population does not have waste removal services. We certainly have these services in the United States, but Americans also produce the most waste per person, over five pounds a day. One country can't fix this large problem of too much plastic waste, but we can do our part. We have a chance to make a change right here in Portland to keep this problem from growing even bigger. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio, did you have a, a question for this panel? Oh, I think there, is there more? Yeah, I think there's one more. Oh, group yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, okay, we'll hold off. Thank you. Appreciate you. Item 400. 
Request of Abigail Andrews to address council regarding United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in our region. Now that we know these facts about plastic and recycling, it's time for us to make a change. Let's start with things that we agree with in our city. We've learned that Portland has a 2030 waste management plan. We agree that it's important that waste management will be an affordable service so that all Portlanders will be able to have equitable access and all Portlanders can participate in this program. Providing equitable access includes hearing from tribal voices, which may share a different perspective on waste management. We also agree with the living wages and benefits of this plan because it will provide decent work and economic growth, which is another sustainable development goal we studied. The stronger waste management infrastructure gives jobs to people that don't have jobs and gives them the living wages they need. Modernizing the infrastructure is important because it will recycle things better and reduce the need to manufacture new plastic products. Now we'd like to tell you the things we disagree with or hope will change. We don't feel that the 2030 waste management program has clearly addressed the strong need for plastic recycling. As it is, only a limited amount of frequently used plastics can be recycled and we believe more types of plastic need to be included in recycling programs. We also think that how the recycling program works should be easier for citizens to understand. The citizens are the ones affected by the plan and if recycling is easier to understand then all citizens will contribute to solving this problem by recycling more. We also noticed that there is no clear waste management plan for people experiencing homelessness. One idea would be to incentivize all people, including those experiencing homelessness, to recycle more things. For example, a 15 cent deposit on cans and bottles may encourage people to participate more. Thank you. As fourth graders, this is so important to us because this is our future and the future of our city and our world. The changes that we are suggesting are important to our city, to its people, and the environment. This issue impacts the way we live, breathe, and eat. We see plastic in our food and our water. <coughs> Animals too shouldn't have to suffer from our actions. You need to take our voices into account. We believe the improvements in the waste management program and to our city's recycling programs should be started as soon as possible, since it will start helping our city and environment right away. This action will help us work towards the sustainable development goals. You can help save our future. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We appreciate you. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. I just want to share um, with all of you that testified, uh, thank you so much for coming here to share your concerns. Um, I just want to say how impressed I am with each one of you and how proud we are of your advocacy. And we got your letter. I know that you sent a letter and a petition to our office, and there, it was signed by dozens of your classmates, and um, you were expressing really clear ideas and concerns about climate change and the and uh, I just want to say your, your testimony is very clear and strong. You raise very good points about our waste management team, and I'll carry, I'll carry those back to our team so that they hear and understand where your concerns come from. Um, and I just want to share that you know, I oversee the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, which is sort of the city's uh, central office that works on ways to reduce carbon and deal with resiliency, uh, um, climate resiliency, but also oversees the waste and recycling. So um, just keep using your voices. Um, it's very important. Your voices are important because you have a very unique perspective as young leaders who are going to be leading us in the future. And so what you're saying and doing now really shape, takes shape and takes root. So we're very proud of your advocacy. You've been strong leaders and shown a lot of advocacy today. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Our Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to thank you all so much for testifying today, participating in democracy, speaking up for what you believe in. It's essential for our city. It's essential for our country. Uh, so thank you for being good citizens. And uh, you got bright futures ahead of you. Uh, keep engaged and uh, keep pushing for what you believe in. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Well, good morning, Art Varks. It's so. Um, it's so wonderful to start the meeting with the school children telling us what we should focus on. And so thanks for telling the stories about going to the beach. 
and about the plastic. I'm really glad I didn't have a plastic bottle with me today. I'd feel so shamed. So um, it's really important that we just constantly hear that message. And uh, there's so many good articles on what you're talking about, but there's nothing better than getting live testimony from people that uh, will be influenced and affected by this the most. So thanks for setting the tone for a wonderful day here at City Hall. Appreciate you, and all of you up there as well. I want to add my thanks. Thanks to all of you who testified, and thanks to all of you who are here from OES, all you aardvarks. Uh, this really speaks well to you as students, and it speaks well to your teachers. These were very thoughtful presentations. They were well practiced, I could tell. You maintained eye contact while you were making uh, your remarks. And I know that it is very intimidating sometimes to sit at that table in a room full of people uh, and speak to the city council, and I think you did an exceptional job. Your message is a very important one, and I'm glad that you're focused on it. I want you to know that here at the city of Portland, as Commissioner Rubio indicated, as the commissioner in charge of planning and sustainability, this is something we take very seriously. I also want to just add an extra here. Earlier today, the Rose Festival Court, which is behind you, I was asked a question, how do you resolve conflict? And I gave my best answer. You topped my best answer. And, and so I want to revise my answer and say I appreciate the spirit in which disagreement was brought to this chamber today. You started by saying, here's where we agree. That's a valuable lesson, is to talk about where do we agree? And you did your research and you looked at our, our climate action goals and our environmental plans and our recycling plans, and you said we agree with this, we agree with this, and we agree with this. That's a powerful introduction to get our attention and understand you're coming to us with advocacy, but with the spirit of trying to reach a good resolution for all of us. And then you identified the areas where you thought the plans were weak or needed revision or could be improved. And I just want to say uh, to, to the Rose Festival Court behind you, uh, I hope you heard that too. I actually thought that was a really, uh, a really good and solid approach. And so I'm going to add that to my answer from earlier this morning. So thank you for, for the question. Uh, kids, thank you for being here today. And to all of you from OES, we, we appreciate you and we thank you for being in our chamber today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. To the consent agenda, have any items been pulled? Two items have been pulled, 404 and 406. 404 and 406 pulled. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Bear with me one second here. Four oh four and six. Four oh four and four oh six have been pulled. Okay. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. First time certain item, please. Item number four zero one. Proclaim May 26th through June 11th, 2023 to be the 116th annual Portland Rose Festival Focus on Fun Celebration. Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation honoring the 116th annual Portland Rose Festival. I'd like to now pass this to Commissioner Maps to introduce this morning's presenters. Commissioner Maps. Um, well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think at this point I am supposed to invite up uh, Marilyn. I, I, I think I am missing part of my run of show, so I'm not sure what we're supposed to do here. It looks like Marilyn Clint, CEO, and Contessa yeah. Diaz Nicolaitis, President. Welcome. Good morning. 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 Good morning. Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Maps, members of the City Council, thank you so much for having us here. I am Marilyn Clint. I'm the new CEO of the Rose Festival, the first woman to hold that title. I accepted that position after Jeff Curtis decided to move on this past year. Prior to that, I have spent decades uh, doing events and communications at the Rose Festival. Believe it or not, I coordinated my first Rose Festival parade in 1976 as the Bicentennial Starlight Parade, the return of our nighttime parade, all those decades ago. 
111 Rose Festival parades have been coordinated under my event's leadership. Back in 2015, Mayor Charlie Hales declared a Parade Queen Day in my honor to honor my work. And while I've given up that parade management role now at Rose Festival, I am currently part of a team of a dozen individuals across North America who are putting together parade safety standards for the American National Standards Institute, a project we hope to have completed in the next couple of years. I am not only committed to Rose Festival and its successful comeback, but I'm committed to the city of Portland and its successful comeback. Unlike my two predecessors, I am a Portland resident, a homeowner, a taxpayer, and a voter. Portland's vision is my vision, both as the Rose Festival CEO and as a citizen of the Rose City. It is an honor and a great responsibility for me to continue my work with Rose Festival as its staff leader. Before I introduce you to the leader of our volunteer board of directors, I want to thank you for your partnership. The Portland Rose Festival Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. The Rose Festival is our gift to the city of Portland and to the Portland region. We could not do this without your support and commitment and without the hard work of the city bureaus and individual personnel who work with us. I want to personally thank two people today. Allison Madsen of the Portland Bureau of Transportation, whose collaboration has helped us continue our hard-earned comeback. And over my long career, I have been privileged to work with many amazing police traffic sergeants. And on those parades that I mentioned earlier, one of those is Sergeant Steve Andrusco. And I want to publicly thank him as he prepares for his final Rose Festival parade um, this season before he retires from the Police Bureau at the end of the year. Now, it's an honor for me to introduce one of the most passionate and committed people I know, the president of our board of directors, Contessa Diaz Nicolaitis. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here representing the board staff, and thousands of volunteers of the Rose Festival Foundation. We have a very busy team making big things in our community, and we're so proud to play a major role in Portland's continuing comeback story as the city's official festival. This year is very exciting. We're going to focus on fun. After everything we've endured these past few years, we need to make time to actively pursue the things that bring us joy. We do what we do because we know the importance of positivity and joy in our community. And the Rose Festival is filled with opportunities to create lasting memories, engaging experiences, and most of all, what I'm most passionate about, which is fun. Some of the fun is already underway, and here today with me are 15 Rose members of our Rose Festival Court, each representing their high schools and their neighborhoods. These amazing young women are all receiving valuable training and scholarships, one-on-one -on -one mentorship from professionals uh, from Unitas Community Credit Union. They are on a journey of outreach to bring the spirit of the Rose Festival to our community. Rose Festival officially opens this Friday at 5 p.m when Commissioner Ryan will help us cut the ribbon to open City Fair at Waterfront Park. And that night, thousands of people will enjoy our opening night fireworks, carnival rides, and corn dogs are what memories are made of. And so generations of families and friends have enjoyed exactly that over the years and will continue to do so. There's so much to see and do during this year's Rose Festival City Fair, three weekends at the waterfront. Last year, Rose Festival was able to collaborate with local events who were not able to return by offering representation in Rose Festival events like the Grand Floral Parade. This year, we are, have been thrilled to see events like Cinco de Mayo, the 82nd Avenue of Roses Parade in St. John's return to the streets of Portland back on schedule. And in keeping with the spirit of collaboration this spring, we announced a new partnership 
with another Portland tradition. We're so excited. The Oregon Brewers Festival, we're thrilled to collaborate this year for a tap takeover during City Fair's second weekend, June 2nd through 4th. And we're thrilled at Rose Festival that we were able to continue uh, to have this um, event uh, in downtown Portland and welcome the Oregon Brewers Festival with us this year. Our three parades are ready to get rolling with the Starlight Parade electrifying downtown streets starting on NATO Parkway. Kiddos will be ready to toot their horns and bring their drums and show the world how fun is done at the Junior Parade in the Hollywood District. And I'm probably not supposed to have a favorite, but I definitely do, and that's the Grand Floral Parade, uh, which will continue on the all east side route, starting at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, and will see its way down Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and end at Lloyd Center this year. This year, there are so many fun features for the Grand Floral Parade, and I can't possibly name them all. The parade will celebrate Oregon culture, as well as our shared history. I'm especially excited to see the float entry that allows us to honor women who have welded or riveted their place through history. Um, the Rosie the Riveters uh, during World War II are here for the American Rosie the Riveter Association annual convention. We will welcome them. The diversity of Portland and its communities are sprinkled throughout the parade. For example, we'll awaken a 100-foot dragon prior to uh, the Rose Festival uh, Grand Floral floral parade. The Royal Reunion will return with past princesses and queens, decades of them, in addition to the 2023 Rose Festival Queen, who will be crowned the day before on June 9th, undercover at Oregon Square. We're hard at work recruiting volunteers, we've been talking a lot about that, for all of our parades, monitor barricades, and to help clean up trash and keep the cleanest and greenest festival in, the war in America to help us decorate the floats in our new building ourselves. As Marilyn mentioned, we are so incredibly grateful for our partnership with the city of Portland. We truly could not do this without all of you. And we wanna thank Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Maps, the entire council for your continued support. We hope you take the time to enjoy this year's Rose Festival and we hope you can focus on fun. And now it is my sincere and great pleasure to present to you the 2023 Rose Festival Court presented by Unitas Community Credit Union. Thank you. Thank you. He taught me a fun fact 
that having fun is an important part of our well-being, and scientists have found that when people have fun, they tend to lose track of time, which proves that um, while having fun, time flies when you're having fun. Sierra! Hi, I'm Sierra. I'm a senior at Central Catholic High School. I am an All-American cheerleader in the 2022 Youth of the Year for the, for the, for the Metropolitan Area for Boys and Girls School. Please join us down at the waterfront June 10th and 11th for Dragon Boat Racing as they fill the Willamette with a vibrant display of color and culture. Piper! Hi, I'm Piper. I'm a senior at St. Mary's Academy. I've been on my school's all-female robotics team, the Beta Blues, and in my free time, I enjoy watching tutorial videos on coding and technological innovations. If you also enjoy illuminating technological technological achievements, then come join us downtown on June 3rd for the Care Oregon Starlight Parade with your friends and family starting at 8 p.m. Nikki! Hello, my name is Nikki. I'm a senior at David Douglas High School. My favorite place to visit in Portland is the Peninsula of Rose Garden. I love seeing the many different colored roses in the summertime. Another beautiful rose field place in Portland is the International Rose Test Garden. While you're there, be sure to stop by the Rose Test Store. Lulu! Hi, I'm Lulu, a junior at Benton Polytechnic High School. I spend a lot of my time dedicated to basketball, but when I can, I love visiting downtown Portland. I love to experience the city vibes, the local businesses, and the culture. Along the waterfront in downtown Portland, you'll find the Rose Festival City Fair. Enjoy your favorite fair foods, carnival rides, and shows every weekend from May 26th to June 11th. Jolene! Good morning, my name is Jo Lynn and I'm a senior at Parker's High School. Filmmaking is a big passion of mine and it's something that I enjoy working on both inside and outside of school. On June 11th, the Hollywood Theater will be filled with youth from around the world celebrating the International Youth Silent Film Awards. So please come stop by and enjoy these youth's inspired works. Alicia! Hi, I'm Alicia. I'm a senior from Lincoln High School. I'm the president of my school's business club, speech and debate team, Indian Student Union, and captain of our girls' varsity golf team. When I grow up, I'd like to run a business. The Portland Rose Festival's Grand Floral Parade is one of the world's most diverse parades. Watch out for our sister city, Kaohsiung, and their award-winning Shute High School Marching Band. Crystal! Hi, I'm Crystal. I'm a junior at Jefferson High School. My favorite part of Rose Festival is the community service and the parades because I like to see the smile on people's faces and the impact I have on others. On June 7th, the Hollywood District will be filled with smiles and laughter at the Fred Myers Junior Parade. Come out and enjoy the oldest and largest all children's parade in the nation. Lily! Hi, I'm Lily. I'm a senior at McDaniel. I'm a reporter and manager for my school newspaper, The Org. This year, the Portland Rose Festival is partnering with Pamplin Media Group to print out coupons in the Portland Tribune and other local news sources for free entry on Fridays for the City Fair. Make sure to be on the lookout for those. Emily! Hi, I'm Emily, and I'm a senior at Cleveland High School. I am the president of my school's Red Cross Club, and my career goal is to become a nurse. The Rose Festival is excited to welcome some of our own frontline defenders from the U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, and Royal Canadian Navy for one of the premier Fleet Week events in the country. Elizabeth! Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a junior at Clackamas High School representing Metro East. I love singing, acting, as well as watching films and plays. The Portland Rose Festival is excited to partner with Dragon Theater to provide a variety of performances and activities for kids in this year's Kids Zone within City Fair. Deja. Deja! Hello, my name is Deja. I'm a senior at Tigard High School representing Metro West. What I'm most proud of for my high school career is being a member of the Intercombio program, which is a leadership program that helps mentor eighth grade students to prepare for their high school success. On behalf of the 2023 Rose Festival Court, we would be honored to have you join us at Oregon Square Park at 11 a.m. on June 9th for the Queen's Coronation, presented by Unitas Community Credit Union. Thank you for hosting the 2023 Rose Festival Court, presented by Unitas Community Credit Union. We hope to see you at this year's Rose Festival. Thank you.
All right, we'll hear from some of our colleagues. Commissioner Maps, why don't you go ahead and start us off, please? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, here we are again, and what a pleasure it is to have everyone in council. Now, I am delighted to join my colleagues on this council in proclaiming May 26th through June 11th, 2023 to be the 116th annual Rose Festival celebration. The theme for this year's Rose Festival is focus on fun. As always, it is great to have the Rose Festival Court with us in chambers today. Since the 1930s, Portland's Rose Festival has included appointing a Rose Festival Court. And one of the things that I try to do every Rose Festival is to read the speeches delivered by members of the Rose Festival Court. The theme for this year's Rose Festival Court speeches is how are you focusing on fun in 2023? So now, colleagues, what I'd like to do is just take a moment to share with you some of the ways our Rose Festival princesses answered that question. For example, Princess Etheridge from Ida B. Wells wrote, the best way to prioritize fun in 2023 is to prioritize myself and to listen to what I need. And Princess Kansu from Roosevelt wrote, this year I plan on focusing on fun. By living in the moment, I also plan on focusing on things that bring me joy, like school activities. And Princess Crow from Franklin wrote, you have to make your own fun. Fun isn't a feeling you chase, it is a feeling you create. And Princess Ta from uh, Park Rose wrote, focusing on fun to me means being present and enjoying those, these next few months with my community before walking across that stage and receiving a diploma. And our princess from Lincoln High School wrote, for me, my idea of fun is trying new things. Our princess Welch from Cleveland wrote, to me, Fun is defined in two ways, your attitude and the people that you're having fun with. Now, colleagues and everyone who can hear my voice, those thoughts also capture what this year's Rose Festival is all about. The Rose Festival is an opportunity to have fun with friends, family, and community. This year's Rose Festival is an opportunity for our community to come together. This year's Rose Festival is also an expression of our city's resilience. And this year's Rose Festival is a reminder that Portland's downtown is open, clean, and safe. Which is why I'd like to close today by thanking the Rose Court for teaching us about the meaning of the Rose Festival. And colleagues, for that reason and more, I am proud to join you in proclaiming May 26th through June 11th, 2023 to be the 116th annual Rose Festival celebration. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, the volunteers at the Rose Festival. I do want to call out as the Commissioner of Public Safety uh, to protect our participants. Uh, it is imperative that we have sufficient volunteers uh, for the parades uh, coming up. So please reach out to the Rose Festival uh, uh, team uh, if you're interested in volunteering. It's absolutely essential that we have numbers on the streets to uh, allow everyone to participate safely. As a reminder, the uh, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management will have our net teams out. That's our neighborhood emergency teams. We'll be volunteering throughout the festival, uh, but we need more numbers collectively. Um, I do want to also highlight the work of the Bureau of Emergency Management with working with the Rose Festival to make sure each uh, parade is fully staffed, in particular Katie Wolf, Operations Manager, and Jeremy Van Curren, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Community Resilience Manager. And if my office can be of any assistance in connecting with volunteer opportunities, please reach out to Commissioner Renee Gonzalez's office. Uh, Grace Sarpak is our contact there. Thank you again for all you do. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubio. 
Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner Maps, for bringing this really bright um, acknowledgement forward today. I want to thank Marilyn and Contessa and the Rose Festival Association, as well as the Board of Directors, and to the esteemed court royalty who have joined us today. I just want to say congratulations to each of you. You make our city proud, absolutely proud. Uh, and we're so excited that we have the Rose Festival back in force, uh, full force this summer. Very, very excited for it. All of us have lifelong memories about going to um, the festival. Um, and in, in addition to being a Portland tradition, it, it feels like a family tradition to all of us as well. Um, and this year is so important because it's an important sign of Portland's vitality and recovery too. So um, very eager to feel that connection again. Um, also, I want to also thank all the dedicated Rose Festival volunteers. There are hundreds of them um, who do everything from creating floats to organizing parade routes, as you mentioned, Marilyn. Um, it takes so many, like hundreds of hours of planning and execution to create these amazing memories for Portlanders. So we're very fortunate uh, to have that in our community. Um, and then last, I wanna join my colleagues in giving a big appreciation to city staff who've also worked really hard to ensure a great event, um, and especially our police officers, emergency management staff um, who uh, work together uh, on public safety events, transportation staff, our events at um, Pros or our event staff at Prosper Portland, um, and also the park staff who tend to the waterfront uh, park grounds and other parks during the festival. So just happy festival, everyone, and uh, my family and I will see you down there. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thanks, Mayor. Good morning, it's so good to see everyone. Marilyn. You are the parade queen, although my spouse would say I'm also a parade queen. <laughs> and um, Contessa, you're such a great um, volunteer. Your energy is amazing, and I'm so happy that you're uh, the president. It's great to have this girl power at the top this year. Uh, I also want to just acknowledge that my very first rose bloomed the, just yesterday, so I brought it in today. Oh. Yeah, I've been growing these things for a while. And because of the cold, remember how cold it was for a while? I was worried. Were you worried? Yeah. So opening night, I'm looking forward to playing with all of you, the Rose Princesses. We get to, um, it, it'll be better than last year just because the weather gods, wasn't it like, it was like thunder, lightning, everything, and really, really wet, I'll never forget it. Um, so it was really hard to enjoy the rides. So I'm looking forward uh, to coming down on Friday to helping kick off. And also, I'm hoping the weather gods stay good to you because I think all three weekends last year were damp, and that's really bad for, um, the gate receipts at the fun center. So let's hope that we, we're lucky all three weekends. And I know I'm looking forward to the Rose Parade, uh, the Junior Rose Parade, the coronation. And I really, uh, last year when I was in the role of Commissioner Maps, I, I became a big fan of those dragon boat race, races. So that'll be fun to be down there for that. Uh, anyway, I'm a little kid excited about the Rose Festival. I used to get up really early with my grandma, like really early. Um, as early as back in the day, you went to strawberry picking, uh, you had to get up at like five, and then also for the Rose Parade. And so um, it was much more fun to go to the Rose Parade and sit on the blanket and wait for it to begin. So I'm really excited um, that this gives our city a chance to just celebrate, be in a joyful place, activate our streets, and you're gonna be a big part of the Rose Court that really um, brought our city um, back out of, I think officially out of COVID, out of the slumber that we've been in. And, and we'll get some joy back on the streets with all of you amazing young women um, leading the way. So thank you, I look forward to seeing all of you the next few weeks. Thank you, and I'd, I'd like to keep my remarks uh, short. I know you have to go back to school, and I know that the kids from OES probably have to do likewise. And by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, Bobby Lee, Bobby, come out here really quickly. Bobby Lee is my chief of staff, meaning he's my most senior uh, administration official. He is a graduate of OES. So fellow aardvark, um, I'd like to begin with a special thanks to this year's Rose Court for being here along with you, Marilyn and Contessa. Thank you for your leadership. Earlier this morning, I had the opportunity with Commissioner Maps to meet with these bright young students who make up the Rose Court. I have to say you're truly an impressive group of young people and it was an honor to meet you all and to, to share some thoughts and ideas and to answer some of your questions. For over 100 years, the annual Rose Festival has been part of our city's cultural fabric. And Leslie, I always forget exactly what year my grandmother was on the court, but I believe it was 1923. That would mean that this would be uh, 100 years ago. 
she stood in your place. And so this is an important tradition for, for us and our household. Beyond a family-friendly way to kick off the summer season, the Rose Festival represents a time for our community to come together and to uplift each other. And I think we can all agree that's something that is very, very important right now. The Rose Festival embodies the best of our city. It demonstrates our diversity, our inclusivity, and our unwavering spirit. I hope Portlanders and visitors alike can take part in this year's festivities. I love the focus on fun, as this year's theme urges us to do. I want to thank you and the many event organizers and volunteers who make this tradition possible. Now, on behalf of the Portland City Council and by, and by extension, the city of Portland at large, I would like to read the annual proclamation in honor of this time. Whereas in 1905, Portland Mayor Harry Lane called for an annual festival to put Portland on the map and brand it as the City of Roses. And whereas the Portland Rose Festival was created in 1907 with a mission to drive economic activity for the region, celebrate Portland's incredible rose climate, and to provide citizens with a common celebration. Whereas the Portland Rose Festival has been produced by the nonprofit Portland Rose Festival Foundation for 116 years as an annual gift to the city of Portland throughout the evolution and growth of the city of roses, and in 2010 was adopted as Portland's official festival. Whereas the Portland Rose Festival continues to keep hope alive by producing programs like the Rose Festival Court, the Queen's Coronation, City Fair, Fleet Week, Starlight Parade, Junior Parade, and of course, the Grand Floral Parade. And whereas, the Portland Rose Festival continues to provide an opportunity from people of all backgrounds, experiences, and cultures to join together to celebrate Portland's rich diversity and common humanity. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim May 26, 2023 through June 11th, 2023 to be the 116th annual Portland Rose Festival Focus on Fun celebration in Portland and encourage all Portlanders to come out of their homes and participate in these amazing events celebrating our city. Thank you. Thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you out at the Rose Festival. Give us the wave on the way out. There you go, the practice. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Colleagues, we have a bit of a gap. I understand, Commissioner uh, Maps, are you going to pull 402? Yeah, pull Let's pull go ahead and read 402, time certain. Accept the operational feasibility study for regional ferry service, include a passenger ferry pilot project in the 2023 Regional Transportation Plan financially constrained project list, and endorse the city's 2023 Regional Transportation Plan project list submittal. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to pull this one back to my office. Without objection. And colleagues, our next item is a time certain at 1025, which is in about three and a half minutes. Rather than do something else, let's just take a three and a half minute recess and reconvene at 1025 so that we keep the agenda in order. We're in recess.
Buddy, we are back in session. Thank you all. Uh, item number 403, please. Proclaim May 2023 to be Mental Health Awareness Month. Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation naming May of 2023 as Mental Health Awareness Month. For this morning's presentation, we're joined by Courtney Gilmore, the Wellness Program Manager, Taisha McCool Riley, the Mental Health Program Specialist, and Dalen Lawrence, Business Services Administrative Specialist. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good you morning. also. I feel like I haven't sat here in a while. So can we begin? Yeah, please, oh. <laughs> at your convenience, thank you. Uh, good morning, um, I am Taisha McCool Riley, Mental Health Program Specialist, housed in the Office of Civic Life. Um, and I would love to think that I could remember everything I need to say this morning, um, but I am going to read some things um, as we uh, come together and acknowledge uh, May as Mental Health Awareness Month. Today we gather in solidarity, acknowledging the prevalence of mental health disabilities and promoting the significance of mental health education, awareness and advocacy against social stigma related to mental health disabilities. We declare today and this month and days to come um, that we all can play a part in because we have a chance to ask ourselves, what do I need or what does the person I care about need to be well? Today, as we gather in honor of um, Mental Health Awareness Month, we acknowledge that we must center our mental health and our wellness far beyond just one month out of the year, that this must be an intentional endeavor that must seek after a daily basis, we must seek after on a daily basis, and for many of us, on a minute by minute basis seeking to normalize conversations about our mental health and our mental well-being. We then acknowledge our humanness and that we as human beings are impacted by our experiences, our thoughts, and our emotions, recognizing that we are not exempt as city employees from experiencing distress, crisis, trauma, hurt, pain, and disappointment. In our humanness, we are complex beings deserving of being acknowledged, validated, included, and nurtured in ways that make us feel valuable, supported, and appreciated. Today, we all stand in solidarity, saying that our mental health matters, our mental health is a priority, and tending to our mental health is a necessity, affirming that taking care of our mental health is equally as important as taking care of our physical health. We can no longer afford to neglect ourselves as our neglect has began to fester and affect many aspects of our lives, leaving us feeling overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, hopeless, burnt out, restricted, and powerless. The past several years have without a shadow of a doubt taken its toll on each of us in unique ways. We have inherently siloed ourselves to merely survive the storm resulting in the loss of our connectedness and community. If we are honest, many of us can speak to that reality, unfortunately. Many have exhausted much energy seeking support and resources in an effort to maintain their sanity, build resilience, and center their well-being. And there's a quote that I wanted to share. It says, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a tune without the words and never stops at all. In our deepest struggle lies our greatest strength. Our wounds can become our wisdom. We can turn pain into medicine. We can feel the light sneak through the cracks in our armor. Let's stay a while longer and hope. The future listens to hope. This quote truly reminds us to embrace the feeling, a feeling of expectation and a desire for certain things to change and occur and to have faith that it can and it shall come to pass. In light of mental health awareness, let us all grab a hold of a desire for peace, tranquility, joy, togetherness, motivation, and meaning, and allow ourselves to nurture that reality for ourselves, our colleagues, and our community at large. 
through to uh, through community, our community acknowledging and sharing our past traumas, it's important for us to share our truths, give one another space for authenticity, while also building one another up, ultimately strengthening our relationships and building our ability to endure the difficulties life continues to throw at us. Because as we know, life just keeps on lifing. Your ability to see a person, hear a person, and empathize with their reality is a great starting place. And I'll close with this. Um, today I'm reminded um, of a story that I heard Saturday afternoon while attending um, TED Talk PDX. Um, and it was uh, Emily Stutzman. Uh, it was her time to stand on the X and to uh, give her TED Talk. And she really spoke about the idea of technology eliminating our connectedness as a community, our ability to really um, be one with one another. And in that, she, um, she really talked about how we are often really lonely, but we claim that we're connected because of technology. And so she really put a twist on it, and she really talked about community engagement, about how we actually commune with one another as human beings, right? And in that, what she talked about is um, one day coming home from school and coming home to seeing her mother being carted out on a stretcher, put into an ambulance, and swifted um, off to the um, hospital from having an aneurysm. And she says her mom made sure everything in the house worked. Dad made sure the bills were paid, but mom made everything work. And she says she remembered for two years straight, they never had to cook a meal. They never had to worry about how they were going to get to school. They never had to worry about how they were going to get to soccer practice, basketball practice. Um, they never had to worry about how they were going to continue to do life as their mom was recovering from this illness. And at the core of that, it wasn't that because dad stepped up and did everything by himself. It was because the people around them saw that there was a need. And they stepped up and said, we want to, we want to support. And so today, as we honor May as Mental Health Awareness Day, let's talk about what community engagement really looks like for us to commune with one another as human beings on a human level, recognizing that we all endure some hard stuff in life. And if we have people around us that truly care and lean in towards our struggles to support us, we all can make our communities a better place. And that goes for us as employees at the city of Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Courtney Gilmore, and I am the City Strong Health and Wellbeing Program Manager. And um, I'm here today to discuss Mental Health, First, Mental Health Awareness Month. And a few years ago, when we um, did the Mental Health Awareness Proclamation, um, Taisha did a beautiful speech on my why. And so I thought about that over the last couple of years, and my why, when it comes to mental health, mental well-being, um, not just for my community, but also within um, the workplace, is stigma, shame. shame. Um, I have personal experience, live experience, when it comes to mental health challenges, mental health crises, um, within my family, my circle, within the workplace as well. So one of the things that I want to talk about when it comes to the workplace um, is that as a collective, we need to talk, talk openly about mental health in the workplace and to reduce stigma and discrimination for people who are less capable to cope. For many of us, work is an, is an essential part of what we do every day. We have to show up and serve the people. Making sure that the workplace is a safe environment where we can discuss and talk about mental health issues will help mitigate the impact of the past three years. A lot has happened over the past three years. Social unrest, um, a pandemic that impacted everyone to one degree or the other. Um, and it has impacted our life personally and professionally. But that has made us more resilient. However, we have a role to play by caring for and supporting our families, our friends, and our work colleagues by continuing to look after ourselves, our well-being, and 
not being afraid to talk, <coughs> talk and seek help when needed regarding mental health and mental well-being. So what are we doing um, as far as Taisha and, myself, Taisha and myself and City Strong, um, our benefits team, we are continuing to provide information and resources from our plan providers, our EAP, and within the last year, we have trained five additional mental health first aid instructors. You may be wondering, what is mental health first aid? Um, this is a program that has been in effect for the last four plus years. It started off with Taisha, then myself, and then um, we train Daylin along with four other people. Um, mental health first aid is something very similar to physical first aid. Um, we assist someone that may be in a mental health crisis. We're not therapists, we're not you know, trying to fix the problem, we're assessing and then we're gonna move them on to a professional. Um, so this has been an ongoing project that we have been working on for the last couple of years, and I'm glad to say that we have, um, have started rolling out trainings to different work groups, bureaus, um, and the LEAD program as well to train our managers and supervisors on how to handle an employee that may be in a mental health crisis. Um, there are employees who are who come into the office or come that work in the field that might be may be in crisis, and so it's important for our, our leaders, our managers, and supervisors to be able to have those tools and skills when it comes to that. Um, in addition, um, for Mental Health Awareness Month, we do have one. Um, we have a couple of activities. We have an event this this morning after. Um, the proclamation where you can meet in a meet and greet where you can talk to us. We have resources for mental health um, for city employees. And then we also have a DIY self-care workshop um, tomorrow from 12 to 3 as well. So thank you for having me here. And I would like to pass it on to Daylin. And those things will take place in the Portland building on the yes, first floor. In the Portland building. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Daylin Lawrence. I'm housed in the Bureau of Human Resources, specifically the Business Services team, but I'm also, as Courtney mentioned, a certified mental health first aid instructor. Um, so first, I'd like to just say that May is my favorite month of the year for multiple reasons. One, um, the flowers become in full bloom. It's also the month of my birthday. But for this purposes, uh, for today's purpose, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. So like a flower, mental health starts off as just a budding seed that you water, you fertilize, you leave it in the sunlight to grow. In order for us as individuals, as humans, to bloom into our best selves, we must tend to our own mental health in the same way you would tend to our, a garden. With that being said, I hope that City employees, city council, um, join me in help watering the garden that is the city of Portland. And I hope that I get to see you in one of my mental health first aid training classes. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. And does that complete the presentation? Yes. yes. Thank you, all three of you. We appreciate <clears throat> it. Commissioner Maps. Sure. Um, I want to start out by thanking uh, the panel for their work in this field in today's presentation. And um, to my colleagues on this council, I just want to say I'm glad to join you in proclaiming May 2023 to be Mental Health Month here in Portland, Oregon. This month, we renew our commitment to ridding our society of the stigma associated with mental illness. We encourage those living with mental health challenges to get the help they need. We reaffirm our commitment to ensure that those who need help have access to the support, acceptance, and resources they deserve. And we pledge solidarity with the families who need our support as well. In 2019, nearly 52 million adults experienced some form of mental illness. Today, that number is likely much higher. The pandemic and the resulting economic crisis has impacted the mental health of millions of Americans. And to make matters even worse, Oregon's mental health system is famously 
amongst the worst in the nation. That's why Portland needs to commit to ensuring that people living with mental health conditions are treated with compassion, respect, and understanding. This council, our partners at Multnomah County, the state of Oregon, and the federal government must work together to do a better job of addressing our community's unmet mental health needs. So, Let's strive to ensure that people living with mental health conditions know that they are not alone, that help exists, and that the possibility of healing and thriving is real. We must also work to ensure that everyone, especially underserved communities, has access to affordable, high quality, and evidence-based mental health care. That's what that's why this Mental Health Month, uh, we should call upon citizens, government agencies, healthcare providers, and research institutions to raise mental health awareness and to continue helping Americans live longer, happier, healthier lives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Taisha, thank you so much for that really a wonderful way to center us. Um, and reminding us it's about the why and what a resource you are. So anyway, thank you, panelists. It's a great way to um, acknowledge it's such an important month that we today um, firmly acknowledge. Last week, I was at the opening of a, a, a Safe Rest Village Peninsula crossing, and it was getting a little heated, so I thought I'd do something and ask the audience, um, how many of you love somebody, including yourself, and someone in your family, your friend network, that suffers from either behavioral health or mental health. And about half the hands went up really quickly because they're confident they've been doing their work and their stigma work has been, you could tell they were on it. But I noticed how others slowly raised their hands. Mm -hmm. So the fact was most of the, the group who's outside had their hands up. And I think that's just a great visualization of lifting the stigma. It's just absurd to think that we're separate from it. I really appreciate that you brought up how important it is to have real in-person contact. I really do think, and you see it definitely in the middle schools and the, in the schools in general, mm -hmm. uh, children don't lie. So what we're experiencing in our schools right now from coming out of the pandemic and being holed up and not having the chance like these wonderful kids to be in person and experiencing life how it's, I think, supposed to be lived. So I, I just think it's such an important time to go hard on this topic. And I think, as Commissioner Mapps mentioned, we just live in a state that has been so behind on doing the work. I always say my state, my city gets locked up in perfection. And because of that, we, we, we don't focus on the good. And this is messy work. And just like anyone that experiences mental health, we know that we might fall down, we're gonna be in a hole. But the fact is we know that we can surrender. We know we can ask for help and we know that we can rise up. And that's how we should be measured in life. It's not that we fall down, because that's inevitable. It's how we get back up. And so I think it's that compassion that good people like you are help promoting. Um, just a couple more stats on Oregon. Uh, as mentioned, we're, we actually do rank last, 51, because we include DC, in terms of mental health and substance use, and also in access to care. That's embarrassing, and we should all feel ashamed about that. And I think what always puzzles me is how we only have one psychiatric hospital, one, and that's in uh, Salem, the Oregon State Hospital. In 95, we closed Damage State Hospital because there were some things that needed to improve there, but we just closed it, and that was in 1995. And 28 years later, we have nothing to replace those 400 plus beds. So when people look around and they wonder why we have so many people suffering on our streets that clearly need extensive help, it's because we're not providing those services. And so I just think it's so important that we continue to just tell that true story. And I'm really proud to be on a city council that's acknowledging the truth of this crisis that's now showing up in such uncomfortable ways on our street. And the denial must go away. And again, we all know somebody that's suffering. And so I stand in solidarity with all of you. I'm grateful that you're here today. And I'm grateful as a council that we took some time today to acknowledge mental health awareness. Thank you so much. Thank thanks, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, and thank you, Mayor, for bringing this forward again today. And I just want to thank each of you for 
your um, presence here and for raising this up. Um, I just want to affirm what you've already said, that this is truly about seeing people and implementing trauma-informed practices here that center um, these voices and experience of people living with mental illness and mental health challenges. Um, and especially when it comes to our employees who, who you're seeing uh, pour their hearts and their energy and their time into the city every single day. Um, and uh, in previous years, you've talked to us about how clearly the pandemic had an impact on that um, for a number of our employees um, and our families. Um, so I appreciate you reminding us about our responsibility to take active conscious steps to support our staff, um, and especially now. Um, and also, I encourage us, all of us to follow the advice that you all sh shared about uh, we, you know, we have a responsibility to be informed um, and also to be trained for ourselves, but also for our teams and, um, and uh, for our colleagues as well. So just thank you for continuing to lift us up. Um, it has now taken hold and it is a part, it should be, but I see that developing more a part of our workplace culture around wellness. So, um, and I thank each of you for that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. I just wanna thank you for your lovely words and also wanna acknowledge uh, comments by my colleagues highlighting the more acute manifestations of mental illness that are very much in our face on a daily basis on the city. But I do wanna reiterate uh, if we want to raise up our community and really address uh, mental health, we do have to fully acknowledge that I think we're all fragile right now. I think post-pandemic, post-response to the pandemic, mm -hmm. there are scars, maybe in all of us, uh, and uh, that's more complex to solve. That sometimes doesn't manifest itself clinically. It's right. it's how we, uh, what we do day to day, mm -hmm. uh, in our everyday lives. And I guess it's just to call out a little bit to our community the essential part of giving each other grace, uh, re recognizing there's fragility throughout our community. Whether someone's manifesting manifesting itself in a real expressive way or it's under the hood. Certainly for our employees, um, I understand sometimes the fear to return to the office, but simultaneously we've got to find a way to work together again, to play together again, sometimes to cry together again. Uh, the importance of that connection, that tangible piece. Um, and it's also as a reminder of the essential work of building communities and building cities and sometimes rebuilding them. And um, that's essential for us to, to return to a healthier time, much less address some of these scars. So thanks again for your lovely words. Thank you. I'd like to also express my gratitude to you. I think we've all seen mental health issues being highlighted in recent years. As you all indicated, this has been a traumatic period in the history of our city and our nation and indeed at the household level. This, we, we've been challenged in ways personally we've never been challenged before. I like the two-prong approach here, acknowledging that our community needs us as leaders, as civic leaders, to work with the community, to work with other governments to help address the withering behavioral health needs in our community and acknowledging that substance use disorders are also complicating the mental health issues for many on our streets. But I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that this has been a very difficult period for public servants. As our society has been challenged at every level, there is a human tendency to ask who's to blame. And it is disappointing to see that people who serve the public in a variety of capacities, including public servants, are often the recipients of some of the anger, the frustration, and the anxiety that the public feels. And I'm not saying it's exclusively public servants. I mean, how many times do we have to read about flight attendants being attacked mm -hmm. for serving the wrong peanuts right. to people on an airliner? Uh, but public servants right now seem to be in the target. And so it's up to us as employers collectively to make sure that the people who work amongst us and in our ranks are well cared for and seen and heard and understood as they not only struggle with the challenges of their employment, but they also have the dual responsibility of struggling with challenges at home. And that is no small feat. And I really appreciate this opportunity to level set and re-acknowledge that truth. 
So it's my honor on behalf of this city council to read a proclamation underscoring all the great comments that you three made. Thank you. Whereas the city takes pride in joining Americans throughout the country in recognizing May 2023 as Mental Health Awareness Month, and whereas the city affirms that Mental Health Awareness Month promotes awareness of the importance of tending to our mental health as it's essential and acknowledges that those living with mental health disabilities are deserving of care, of understanding, of compassion, and of pathways to hope, healing, recovery, fulfillment, and inclusivity. And whereas the city acknowledges the continuing need to dismantle systems of oppression for members of our workforce and communities that experience discrimination or barriers for accessing mental health services. And whereas the city commits to establishing an ongoing dialogue with advocates, community organizations, and government entities with the intention of taking collective action towards supporting a healthy society. And whereas the city supports mental health awareness as an opportunity to inspire and embolden meaningful action within our organization to reinforce the health and safety of the greater Portland community. And whereas promoting a psychologically healthy culture is a priority through training and building leader skill sets that support mental health and positive relationships and equipping workers to manage daily stress and handle the inevitable challenges that affect their mental well-being. And whereas increased awareness and understanding, support tools, resources, and capacity building help to build a healthy foundation from which the city workforce can build upon to strengthen ourselves, build resilience, and collectively cope and heal from past adversity and be better equipped to manage future adversities. And whereas we recognize the importance of providing employees with a voice to be able to identify their needs and express how they would like to be supported. Creating space to foster a sense of well-being that's felt throughout promoting feelings of being part of an environment that recognizes and values employees. Contributing to breaking down barriers and enabling employees access to various learning and development opportunities focused on collective healing and holistic well-being from varying perspectives. To ensure inclusion and a person-centered approach to elevating mental wellness. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim May of 2023 to be Mental Health Awareness Month in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this month. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Can you. I shout out, is it Matt? Please. What's Matt's last name? Courtney? Blanco. Blancas. Blancas. I want to shout out Matt. Matt and myself co-authored the um, proclamation, and I just want to give Matt props. He's not, he's not able to join us today, but I just wanted to make sure he got his, his props for contributing to the thank writing. Thank you to you, and thank you to Matt. It's beautifully written. Well thank done. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank All you. right, thanks, Aardvarks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> Take care. Are you going back to school now? No. <laughs> I'm the base. Some are. All right. <laughs> Mixed answer. <laughs> All right. Well, be sure to tell your parents I said you should go back to school. <laughs> See, this is how we get in trouble, right? <laughs> All right, colleagues, we will go to the regular agenda, please. Uh, item 411. Amend Joint Office of Homeless Services Intergovernmental Agreement with Multnomah County to extend the term of the agreement. Colleagues, our first regular agenda item is 411, an amendment to extend the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Portland and Multnomah County with respect to the Joint Office of Homeless Services for one more fiscal year, fiscal year 23-24. Like you, I'm disappointed by the underspent resources by the Joint Office of Homeless Services. These substantial funds that we learned last week went largely unspent are from our regional supportive housing services tax measure. Far too many in our city are living in dangerous 
and squalid conditions. This is a humanitarian catastrophe for our unsheltered neighbors, and it also creates public health, safety, and livability concerns for the community at large. We're in an emergency situation, and we must expend the funds available to us for the purpose for which they were intended, which is to address the crisis. We also learned of additional unanticipated resources totaling $25 million. I'm grateful that the county chair, Jessica Vega Peterson, agreed to advocate for $20 million of the unanticipated funds to go towards the city's temporary alternative shelter sites on an ongoing basis. I appreciate that the chair will champion this funding for the temporary alternative shelter sites to the Board of County Commissioners. This funding is on top of the wraparound services the county has agreed to provide to these sites, behavioral health services, substance disorder treatment services, and housing placements. Chair Vega Peterson is a great leader and a great partner and I'm honored to co-champion this necessary addition to our continuum of care alongside her. The renewed partnership between the city and the county gives me hope that we can build a system of care for all Portlanders, especially our most vulnerable. I also want to thank Governor Tina Kotek for her steadfast support of our temporary alternative shelter sites. Governor Kotek provided funding for 140 pods and six months of operational costs for our first site through our executive order and the all-in plan. We're moving in the right direction, and I look forward to the continued strong partnership from the county, the joint office, and state as we work together to reduce unsheltered homelessness and provide services to people experiencing homelessness all across our city. However, we must remain accountable and clear-eyed. While we've made progress over the last five months, we need to continue seeing operational and policy changes to keep this relationship intact. As such, this amendment, unlike previous extensions to the IGA with the Joint Office of Homeless Services, contains clauses stating that the city will review its relationship with the Joint Office in December of 2023 to determine if steps should be taken to dissolve the partnership or alternatively to commit to a longer partnership. The amendment also contains a clause stating that the city and the county must provide any information requested in writing by the other party. Another important change this year is the hiring of Dan Field as director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Dan is the right person for the job, and he knows that there's no easy task. Dan is here. Where is he? I don't... Where, Dan is here. Dan, welcome. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. We appreciate your leadership. I'm glad I said nice things about you <laughs> with you standing right there. Chair, Vega Peterson and I have full confidence in Dan and his leadership, and the chair and I have pledged that we will continue to support you and work with you and help uh, overcome the inevitable challenges that you will experience in this new role. The chair and I, along with our staffs, will support, I already said that. This extension provides an opportunity for a restart between our governments and for the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Before moving on, I'd like to move an amendment to remove the emergency clause on this item. Can I please get a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Ryan. Is there any further discussion on the removal of the emergency clause? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. I think it's important that we create some space for the city and county to work through some very difficult issues with re respect to this agreement and the overall flow of funds. For that reason, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment's adopted. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, I believe you also have an amendment you'd like to propose. Is that accurate? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to substitute Exhibit A in the proposed ordinance by the mayor with this version. So do I start reading from whereas? C. So, Commissioner Ryan, I think to, in the interest of time, I think you would just highlight the sections that are ad added based on the Exhibit A that was submitted with the mayor's ordinance. I mean, you could read the whole thing if you want, but if you just 
I, my understanding it is recitals C and D and directives and three. to or directives or agreement sections two and three. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Whereas measurable community wide indicators intended to assess and improve the rate of homelessness have yet to be determined, City Council directs the Chief Administrative Officer to commence a comprehensive review and assessment over the next six months of the Joint Office of Homeless Services Intergovernmental Agreement between Multnomah County and the City of Portland as referenced in Exhibit A, encompassing but not limited to the following areas of evaluation collectively the measures. One, produce quantitative community-wide indicators so we can align on shared goals and monitor progress towards agreed upon goals. Two, once community-wide indicators are determined and in order to reach population results, the city is requiring the Joint Office of Homeless Services to establish sub-indicators as a provision in service provider contracts and three, because different populations deserve different strategies, the Joint Office of Homeless Services will coordinate with the city and community solutions to determine effective and efficient intervention strategies, targeting specific segments of the city and county's homeless population, including, but not limited to, individuals who are chronically homeless, essential frontline workers experiencing housing hardship, in individuals living on fixed incomes, inclusive of people with disabilities, elders, and individuals with dual diagnosis for mental health conditions. And D, whereas, following the evaluation of the Chief Administrative Officer shall produce a detailed report outlining the findings of the review and assessment, including recommendations for potential modifications or improvements to the Joint Office of Homeless Services Intergovernmental Agreement. Now I go down to C, correct, Lindley? Annual budget. Annually, this has changed a lot in the last two hours. I hope I have the right one. Can I just clarify? I, uh, I believe there's, is there new language in two or is it the same? Could somebody clarify? Tony? I believe it's the same. It's the same? Okay, so you're correct. Then just three annual budget. Right. Annual budget. Annually, the county will present the joint office JOHS portion of the draft budget to the city, their review and feedback for the, to the review for their, should be there for the review and feedback. Starting in fiscal year 23-24, county will include in their draft joint office budget presentation a plan for spending down any city total spending accounts carried over or unspent from a prior fiscal year. As a condition precedent before the county expends any funds appropriated by the county for the joint office for a fiscal year. The county must first receive from the city a resolution adopted by the Portland City Council agreeing with the county's budget appropriations for the joint office for the fiscal year. I think that completes it, correct? Right. Very good, is there a second? or any discussion? Uh, Commissioner, I, I have one question. Have, has this been shared with the county? Yes, we had a meeting uh, yesterday afternoon with, with uh, Chair Vega-Peterson. And, and what was the chair's reaction? Uh, the chair's reaction in that conversation, which we shared with your staff through my chief of staff, was that they were very um, appreciative of the dialogue. They really um, were all in for especially one, two, and three. The chair shares our desire to have accountability, to let voters and investors who are taxpayers know where we are and where we're going, and the accountability uh, and the streamline to the provider contracts that will also look at those sub-indicators that they will measure in their contracts for more accountability. Very good, I'll second it. Uh, do you want to leave this open through testimony? Yes. What's your preference? I think it's always important to keep it open okay. when, when we're doing testimony. We'll, yeah. leave, we'll leave this open. Very good. Um, and more importantly, there's also been dialogue with Dan Field himself okay, as, good. as we bring in a new leader. Good. Yeah. And, and do we have actually a presentation on this or are we going straight to te public testimony? Do we have people signed up, Keelan? We have one person signed up. Very good. Jim Atwood. 
Welcome. Thank you. And if you could just, uh, even though it's redundant, could you state your name for the record? I'm half deaf. Could you speak up? Yes. Could you please uh, state your name for the record? Oh, thank you. Of it's course. required. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jim Atwood, and uh, I uh, want to support your uh, the, the mayor's um, uh, advocacy for campsites for our unhoused people, and I think that some of these are better off. Uh, in pods and campsites than they are in multifamily buildings. I think you have a, a item later on the agenda uh, uh, connecting uh, mental health and substance abuse recovery with these services in their camp campsites and pods. And uh, I want to support that as well. And I think that a lot of these folks simply will be happier in their campsites and pods than they would be in multifamily buildings. Uh, as you know, I'm an advocate for downtown housing and, and brick buildings, and so while I'm here, I'd like to make a little pitch for brick buildings. Take, for instance, the uh, fire, the May apartment fire last week. Now, we still don't know who started that fire, but we do know that a lot of homeless people from the Blanche House recently moved into the building. And I want to emphasize, we don't know that any of them started it, but if it turns out that one of them did start it, I think it would give you reason to reconsider the, uh, some of the housing first policies that the county is peddling. And more importantly, I keep hearing city employees refer to the May as a dangerous building. I just want to point out some of the good qualities of that building. It was a historic brick building. The fire started one morning last week. It burned through the night and into the next morning. Had that been a frame construction, the building would have burned to the ground very quickly and uh, we'd have no time to uh, rescue the many residents that were in fact rescued from the building. Uh, so I went by the May this morning and the building is still standing. Had it been a frame construction, it would be a pile of ashes and quite likely human bones in the ashes. So there is some benefit to brick buildings. And uh, they also took credit for saving the adjoining buildings, which are frame, and they would also be a pile of ashes. But I think it was the, the brick buildings, more likely than not, that saved the adjoining frame construction buildings. And quickly, with regard to earthquakes, uh, all the pictures I saw, the collapsed buildings and the recent Turkey mega earthquake, were pictures of cement slabs and tangled steel rebar and uh, people were uh, buried and waiting for heavy equipment to rescue them. I read one heart-wrenching story of a man who held his mother's hand while she died, waiting for heavy equipment to uncover her. If someone's buried under a pile of bricks, family, neighbors, and other rescuers can lift bricks. So um, again, it's the rich architects and, and engineers who stand to benefit financially from seismic retrofits that are bashing brick buildings as they are You'll notice that they haven't offered to design these retrofits pro bono. And in conclusion, uh, I want to mention brick buildings have architectural and historical significance that newer buildings simply don't have. They're an important part of the fabric of the city of Portland. And they, well, they make Portland, Portland. Brick buildings have important safety features over other types of construction. All construction has its pros and cons, but in conclusion, I'd like to say that we should show brick buildings the love and respect that they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your perspective on that. That's helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. That and completes, that completes testimony. public testimony. All right. So uh, the this is obviously a first reading, but we will call the roll on the amendment. Any further discussion on Commissioner Ryan's amendment? Uh, Commissioner Maps. Um, and then Commissioner Gonzalez. Frankly, I'd love to hear some dialogue from my colleagues, especially uh, from my colleagues who have been involved in the negotiations with the county. So I'll defer to Commissioner Gonzalez and Mr. Mayor if you have a perspective on um, the amendment. I'd be interested in that too. Commissioner Gonzalez. Sure. So I want to break down a couple of pieces in the amendment, what's been discussed over really the last 24 hours, what's included here, what's not included. Um, first of all, we have a review mechanism uh, really championed by uh, Commissioner Ryan's office, uh, and I'll let him speak to what that's attempting to address, uh, although I think it's somewhat self-explanatory. Two other items that were part of the discussion uh, is one, general government governance. You know, how, how are key decisions made at the joint office? What is the city's uh, involvement in that? 
changes to governance are largely excluded from this proposed amendment. And that was in response to comments from the county, as I understand it. Um, I'm not sure that sits well with me, but there's a, uh, there is a partial analysis of uh, necessary as to what are our existing rights contractually with the county that we are not fully leveraging as a city in the status quo before the amendment. And so I think to create some space to fully, you know, but to appropriately make an assessment there, we need to go back, reopen the existing agreement, evaluate uh, what rights we have there, and make sure that we're fully leveraging them effectively as stewards for city dollars. Uh, the next piece is the annual budget um, mechanism. And um, this is section three of the amendment. Uh, there's really two portions of this. There's sort of a pre-review of a budget by the city. Um, and then uh, second, there's essentially uh, approval rights once it goes through uh, the county budgeting process. Uh, I think the county has seen some of this. I'm not sure they've seen this exact version, so we'll see what their comments back are on it. Um, I would, you know, would like to acknowledge we discussed a some further firmness in our ability to engage in the budget process before it circulated. Um, you know, whether we'll have rights to earmark or specify specific categories. I'm not sure the first sentence gives us those rights to the extent, you know, in an ideal world I would ask for, um, but I do appreciate that we have the, the right to, uh, the word is not used in the amendment, but the right to veto the budget uh, as, once it goes through the county's process. So that's where this sits. I, uh, I think the county has looked at versions of this. I'm not sure they've seen this entire version. Um, and I think they're, what I would encourage everyone uh, to do is to make some space uh, over the next week or weeks uh, for the city and county to continue to uh, uh, find common ground on this going forward. I want to emphasize one last piece. The status quo is not sustainable. I will not support extension of this agreement uh, without substantial rework on budget and to a certain extent governance. And I think this amendment is, uh, is a step in the right direction. Uh, I appreciate Commissioner Ryan's collaboration on it. To a certain extent, I believe the mayor's office was involved in pieces of it, although it's all been happening in real time. So uh, they may not have had a chance to fully digest every aspect of this, but um, we are distributing 43 plus million dollars as a city to the joint office. Um, the outcomes on our street are um, not where we want them to be. Uh, and separately, the city is spending substantial dollars directly in addressing the homeless crisis in its various manifestations. That's true from Portland Street Response. It's true in our community health division through CHAT and providing medical care to homeless individuals. It is certainly true in the community safety division in all of its various uh, components that it's spending directly. It's true in parks and providing emergency shelter, and it's true in uh, PBOT and cleaning up derelict uh, vehicles. We are spending substantial dollars. So uh, the status quo is not satisfactory. We are not getting the return on investment as a city we need. Um, and uh, I, again, I think this amendment is a step in the right direction, but I will not support renewal of the agreement without substantial rework in uh, the basic operations of that relationship. I'll leave it at that. Very good. Any further discussion? Mr. Mayor, do you Commissioner have Maps? Uh, I just have a question for you. I know you're deeply involved in um, the crafting of this contract and whatnot. Do you have any reaction to Commissioner Ryan's uh, amendment? I, I do. Um, and, and granted, it's it's been somewhat fluid. And, yeah. and um, as you indicated, Commissioner Ryan, it's it's been changed as recently, I believe, as this morning. Um, and my, my main question was really whether or not the county had seen this or whether they would be surprised by it. Uh, the impression I have having spoken to the chair is that she is supportive of any other information we need in order to be comfortable with the contract. And my experience with her thus far has been that she's been very open to that. Uh, the conversations my staff and I have had with her and her staff over the last few days have been very productive, is how I would describe them. I think she sees 
our perspective, and indeed I understand more about her perspective as well and some of the challenges she may face in her present position uh, with regard to the management of the joint office. I believe the chair is prepared to work with us and collaborate. I believe the public demands it. And so from my perspective, I will support the amendment acknowledging that there, there may be some rework or more information that's required. I know that Commissioner Ryan and his staff have put a, a ton of time and energy into this. Um, I would ask my staff at this point, is there anything else I should be aware of, Skylar, or anything else I should have said that I didn't say, or anything I said that I should not have said, since you're the one who engages in most of these conversations on my behalf? Okay, all good. Um, so I'll, I'll just be transparent. My intention is to support Commissioner Ryan's amendment, understanding that over the course of the next week, that may precipitate some other conversations, as Commissioner Gonzalez has indicated. Uh, thank you, and uh, I have a couple of process questions. So, uh, we stripped out the emergency or we, the emergency clause here, so it's basically a regular ordinance. Let's say council passes it this week. Does the county also have to weigh in and um, have a vote and pass this contract? Or do you, so I'm seeing a head shake from staff. So they um, they uh, have. They, the county will need to vote on this too. And because this is an, uh, a regular item as opposed to an emergency ordinance, if we pass this on the 24th, uh, the next time, if we pass it on the 31st of May, um, the ordinance would go into effect 30 days after that, which is roughly the last day of June, so we have about 24 hours breathing room. Um, on, I think the contract expires on the end of June, so we'll have about one day's space to make sure that we don't have a gap in at least our legal paperwork. Yes, I'll, I'll defer to legal counsel, but I, I believe we've cut it even more closely than that in the past. Uh, Lindley, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, while it is ideal to have it complete and effective before the date it expires. Um, council has in the past been able to ratify contracts even if they expire and have a, you know, essentially pass it the week after and have it ratified backwards too. To, so it, it's doable. Okay, um, thank you very much. And as long as I um, have the floor, I'll just put my cards on the table. I appreciate Commissioner Ryan's uh, amendments in, the, in this space. I am, uh, dissatisfied with this contract. I don't understand why we keep um, just extending this without actually addressing the concerns that I know each and every member of this council has. Um, I find it utterly mystifying that we could give one of our partners 40 X million dollars um, and we have almost no influence over how these dollars get spent. None of us would have a contract within our own bureaus for something like this. If I were to build a, a piece of infrastructure, I would not give a contractor $40 million and then say, build what you want. Uh, um, I find this to be crazy and unsustainable. So I am likely uh, to vote yes. I, I on the um, amendment today, um, I cannot at all guarantee that I will be a yes vote on the final vote next week though, um, because I don't understand why we continue to be here, and I can't imagine why we would give away tens of millions of dollars every year without having an influence over how we spend it. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll on. Sorry? Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I'm sorry. I, I want to follow up on one uh, piece that Commissioner Maps is alluding to, and we may bring up the, at the appropriate time, bring up uh, uh, Mr. Garcia from the city attorney's office. One of the mechanisms that exist, as I understand it, under our existing relationship, um, we send 35 million to the county. We separately have approved, you know, another 8.3 in, in change that goes to the county as well. If I get the numbers right, it's around 43 million total. Um, we, there, there's an argument we have the right right now to specify the use of those dollars when we send it. That we make a condition on sending the dollars. Um, when we send it to the county. And whether we are fully leveraging that 
those rights that exist today um, is an open question. So uh, I share with you the deep concerns about a blank check without uh, commitments as to how those dollars are gonna be spent, without having uh, real ability to exercise our fiduciary duties as our responsibility to the city and to manage city dollars. Um, where I'm hoping that we create some space in the coming weeks is that we evaluate more and that we articulate very clearly what our existing rights under the contract to mandate, you know, when we send dollars to the county, how those dollars are spent. And certainly they can say we're not going to agree and they could send the money back. I mean, that's, uh, so I think that's something that we need to be crystal clear as a council, what are our existing rights there um, and whether we're appropriately, for lack of a better term, leveraging those rights. Second, governance. There is a, and I don't know if Mr. Garcia is available right now from the city attorney's office. We can, you know, at the appropriate time, have him chime in. Um, just understanding the existing, oh, I think he's here. So understanding the existing um, approval mechanisms in the contract that, um, are spelled out currently that may not, you know, be fully leveraged as we go. I and mean, again, one of the pieces that was removed from this proposed amendment was to address some sort of executive committee or governance committee. Um, and there's an argument that already exists on the contract, and we're not really leveraging it. So I'd let Mr. Garcia speak to that if he's if he's here. Is that okay, Mayor? Is that, is that yeah, okay? Yeah, of course. Right, go ahead. Welcome. Good afternoon, for the record, Tony Garcia, Chief Deputy in the City Attorney's Office. What would you like me to speak to, Commissioner? So the, and I wanna, I may be getting the acronym wrong. Was it called the ELT or there was a mechanism? Uh, what is the mechanism for governance at a high level under the existing agreement? In Amendment 13 to the contract, an ELG group was created. That's an executive leadership group. It includes uh, four individuals. Uh, the commissioner in charge of the housing bureau, one member of their staff, the chair for the county, and one member of their staff. And they are to get together to meet and make policy decisions regarding the budget and how funds are spent. And how prescriptive are, are is the ELG's authority under the existing agreement? High level, we don't necessarily need to know. <laughs> it's not very specific. It's okay. aspirational, mostly that the parties will work together. Okay. so. Colleagues, that may not be sufficient from my vantage point, but at least I think we create some space to dialogue on, do we build that up further um, in the coming weeks? I know the county had some concerns about what we might have proposed there, and so I understand over the last 24 hours, but I do think that's an opportunity. Let's revisit that mechanism. Many of us here have experience in the nonprofit world, in for-profit world, where we set up a governance model where you have a small set that's can help guide this. We have to create space for the executive director to actually operate the joint office. So it's, we don't want to be in his business in every respect, but to, the, that we can look at each other with a straight face and conclude we're providing sufficient governance from, from the city's perspective. So I, I would just put that out that I, we may need to beef that up a little bit from my vantage point. Um, and I can work with each one of your staffs if you're if you're able to provide some commentary and feedback of what you'd specifically like to see. I can workshop that with the county and their council. One last area of question. So the 35 million plus 8.3, you know, I, that's the way I think of it. Um, what are our legal rights in terms of sending that money to the county and dictating how those dollars are spent? Again, obviously, county can come back and say no, uh, but uh, uh, just walk us through our existing rights under existing contract, when we send money to the county, what are what are our rights there? Well, I think our rights are whatever we've established in the contract. So at this time would be when we would put any qualifications or uh, specifics as to what we want to see with that money for the following fiscal year. So the current amendment um, proposed by Commissioner Ryan does put some more language in there about how to get to that point, and so that hopefully the city and the county will be there next year for the following fiscal year's budget. But we could do that at any point in time each year that we reauthorize this agreement. So short of a full amendment 
or explicit contractual language, when we send a quarterly payment to the county, do we have any rights to specify how those dollars are spent? I think we have to rely on the contract we've already agreed to and reimburse them for the costs as long as their costs were within the scope of the contract, which they generally are. And I'm happy to speak to more specifics about that, maybe off the record or with your staff. Yeah, I think that, again, we create some space here. I think this is an area that we continue to fully evaluate. I, you know, I don't want to throw stuff into the amendment that's unnecessary, but I, we've documented a lot of out-of-pocket that the city is paying for directly when it comes to homelessness. And I, you know, personally would like some assurances that we have a mechanism to get that reimbursed um, as, as we go forward. Leave it at that. Commissioner Maps. Um, two things. Um, first, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I really appreciate uh, that dialogue and that clarification. Um, it helps, although I have to I have to share with uh, my colleagues on this council and the people who can hear my voice. I, do, I just do not understand why how city dollars are allocated is something that we have to negotiate over or should negotiate over. Um, if, the con if the county doesn't want to do whatever services that we're, we're trying to purchase, you know, that's fine. Uh, um, but I don't think that we would do this in any other space. Um, I don't get this at all. Uh, um, and setting up a, a committee to, to, to figure out how much influence the city has also just doesn't make any sense for me. And it's kind of a non-starter, although I guess it the amendment maybe represents a, uh, an improvement over the status quo. That's just sort of where I'm at. We can deal with the final vote next week. Um, and I also, before I, um, before we vote on the proposed amendment, I also just uh, do note that we have Dan Field um, here, the incoming head of the joint office, if not the current, I'm not sure if you're currently active, uh, acting or not. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't want to put you on the, uh, on the spot, but um, if our colleague wanted to address council or had any thoughts, I certainly would be interested in hearing whatever perspective that the uh, head of the joint office brings. But um, it's your meeting, Mr. Mayor. I'll let you decide if that's a good idea or uh, Mr. Field decide if he has anything he wants to share today. Yeah, well, I, I think that's up to Dan. Did you have anything he wanted to share? I generally don't make people testify. <laughs> We've been talking about subpoena power lately, so. <laughs> Never turn down a request to talk in public. I'm Dan Field. Yeah, Mingus may regret this in a few He may, minutes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Dan Field, uh, the brand new director of the joint office. Three weeks on the job. Appreciate the chance to be here. I thought it was important for me to be here and listen to the concerns expressed. I appreciate the dialogue with the city attorney's office uh, to understand the nature of the agreement. Um, so I don't have any specifics other than to say I think the amendment is absolutely framing the right discussion that council needs to have over the next week with the county. That discussion's already begun, as the mayor and Commissioner Ryan mentioned with the chair. I have a lot of confidence, especially with the more controversial piece of the amendment regarding governance. I have confidence that we'll get there. I, I think having the conversation in and of itself is healthy. We need to understand what the joint decision-making and priority-setting process is in the joint office, if we're gonna fulfill the promise of that. Um, I do think let's keep in mind why we created a joint office in the first place. There's a really complicated set of braided funding that needs to come together effectively to address the continuum of needs from the, the city's priorities around temporary alternative shelter to long-term rent support, uh, shelter, and other strategies. So if we're gonna fulfill the promise of a comprehensive strategic plan, we've got to do it together. And so I, I don't take lightly any indications from elected officials in whatever quarter who talk about stepping away from a joint strategy because a joint strategy is the only thing that's gonna get us there. So I know this is hard work. I know this is frustrating. I hear the frustration, I hear the concerns, and I think we've got to lean into them rather than back away from them. So that's my pledge and that's my pitch. Short term, we gotta do something in the next week to address uh, the ideas that uh, have been put on the table today. But more importantly, long term, we have to develop a joint strategy that we can all sign off on. <clears throat> so we're not having this conversation over and over and over every six months. And I think we'll get there. Yeah, Dan, if, if I may be so bold, uh, you know, 
partially the timing is working against us here. We have a new chair, we have you as the new director of the joint office, but the IGA expires at the end of June. And so we're, if, if we'd had an extra two months to work on this, I, I think we, we might have gotten farther than we have. Uh, but you, you said something that I agree with fundamentally. We now are very clear that the problem on our streets goes well beyond just the question of housing. We have significant behavioral health issues. We have significant substance use disorders. We have basic health care needs for those who are on our streets. And part of our strategy to off-ramp from people from the streets has to include those services. We do not provide those services. The county provides those services. The county not only has the infrastructure and the expertise to provide those services, they actually have connection to the federal and state streams of funding which support those services, an area you happen to be an expert in given your background, <coughs> more than me, I'll put it that way. Um, but your, your experience with the CCOs and those relationships put you in good standing to help us navigate some of those issues. So from my perspective, while there is more I would like to see from a governance perspective, if this is joint, then truly we have to make personnel decisions together and we have to make budgeting decisions together. And I agree with you. I think we're moving rapidly in that direction, particularly given some of the chair's uh, uh, agreements to support the, the programs and the services that we are spearheading here at the city of Portland. But ultimately, we can't do it independently of the human services infrastructure at the county. That's just the bottom line. That is a fact. So we have to figure out how to work within the confines of uh, the spaces where we you know, work within the confines of our own spans of control. We, we, we have to partner. It's the prisoner's dilemma, right? Uh, writ large. Very and so I, I would like us to continue to, and I hear my colleagues, I, I absolutely empathize and I agree with, and I understand all of the concerns they are raising, but I do believe we're moving in the right direction. And I will reiterate again, I think you're exactly the right person for the job at the right time. And we're lucky to have you in the position you're in, because you know it's a tough one. Well, I appreciate that. And I want to echo what you said, uh, Mayor, about the chair. You're characterizing conversations you've had with her, and I think uh, my experience observing her and talking with her is exactly the same. So she is committed to a, a partnership that uh, fulfills the promise of the joint office. She's saying that to her team privately as well as you privately, and she'll say it publicly. Where that lands us in terms of a governance model, in terms of a precise financial contribution to the city uh, piece of the strategy, that's for you and the chair and, and the rest of the council and the, and the board to decide, but that's where we're headed. Okay. And so there's no question that our interests and our objectives are aligned, and of course the political process is negotiating the details. Okay, good. Um, so colleagues, we have a lot of people waiting for uh, an important proclamation. Are there any burning questions or can we vote on the amendment? Let's call the roll. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. As a commissioner who oversaw the joint office with the county for more than two years, I understand the importance of this vote very well. I also think it's honest to say that Portlanders would agree that we are failing on our mission to reduce homelessness in our city, and most would say that we are not doing enough for mental and behavioral health and drug addiction. I had two primary focuses during my two-year tenure, and that was to build a culture rooted in data to improve the system and to build an on-ramp program with, for chronic homelessness to stability. Today, we're moving forward to ensure that we build a data-driven culture with our partners at Human Solutions, built for zero. And I'm grateful that we also successfully have launched the SRV program. We have five open and two more to open this summer. And the good news is we have data. And we have over 50% of the participants have moved into stable housing after three to nine months of service. However, outside of the ARPA-funded SRV program, there was a little sense of collaboration at times and shared goals between the city and the county on addressing homelessness. Today, I support the extension of the contract only due to the new leadership of County Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson and Joint Office Director Dan Field. And we are so grateful to have you here today, Dan. I'm hopeful that the county will be thought partners with the city that the city needs, that all of us need, to deliver results that Portlanders expect. 
However, we cannot continue to fund an office that isn't delivering on the needs of our homeless community. Voters and taxpayers need to know where we are and where we are going, hence the data-driven dashboard. Providers need to align their work to move the needle and measure their progress. This commitment to accountability and transparency will improve the system. That's why I feel it's important that we amend the contract to include these tangible measurements to hold the joint office a community accountable to these tangible solutions. I vote aye. Gonzalez. So I, I, again, I wanna appreciate my colleagues' work on this for the last 24 hours, the engagement of the county, um, leadership of the mayor, very nice to meet you, Mr. Field. Look forward to a, a deeper discussion. Um, I think we made progress uh, over the last day. Uh, it's not exactly where I want it to be. <clears throat> Um, I th I'm looking forward to space to continue to improve the relationship and clarify uh, in the coming week or so um, and want to create space that we don't necessarily have to do that in a uh, in front of the whole public. We can do some of that in private and then present out to the public what, what we resolve. Um, but um, I want to make one last uh, observation on the relationship between the city and county as the new guy here and uh, witnessing on a number of fronts the interaction interactions um, I you know the city of Portland is in some ways uniquely positioned in its relationship with the county we're nearly 80% of Multnomah County's population we have substantial apparatus substantial infrastructure and I'm for better or worse we're held responsible by voters for many of the challenges that are faced on the streets of Portland. Whether we are by statute responsible for those things, the city is who voters often look to to solve the problems of livability. And um, I think as we define our relationship on the joint office, our relationship on public safety, our relationship on emergency management, uh, all of these are things I touch in my day-to-day -day job as commissioner of public safety. I think we have to frame it with that in mind, that the statutes that address um, county and city responsibilities, uh, even some of the federal funding mechanisms that uh, presume a large county and a relatively small city, don't fully reflect the reality of what goes on in the city of Portland and Multnomah County, just given our relative size to the county. And I just make that more of an observation um, I, I, it's not a prescription. It's just five months on the job and watching these different intersections. It's somewhat unique in the state, in, in my opinion. It's not completely unique, but it's somewhat unique. Um, bottom line, I'm going to vote aye on this uh, amendment, uh, but I believe there's further work to be done, and uh, hopefully in collaboration and uh, uh, as adults to continue to flesh out this very complex relationship. Um, I appreciate the dialogue we've had today, and I really appreciate uh, Mr. Field uh, addressing council, especially on the fly. Um, I do hear some disagreement in this room, and I hear some consensus. Uh, um, I hear something which I think there's consensus on. Um, it is past time, I think that we all agree, that the city of Portland and Multnomah County sign a contract that clearly articulates the parts of the houselessness crisis, which are a city responsibility, the parts of this houselessness crisis, which are a county responsibility, and the parts of this houselessness crisis, which are a shared responsibility. Unfortunately, the contract we are being asked to renew today does not do that. Instead, our current arrangement with the county basically boils down to the city giving the county 40 million dollars a year or so to support household services. The county decides how to spend it. The city has very little influence over how uh, joint office dollars are spent. In fact, the city of Portland struggles to get basic financial and programmatic data out of the joint office. This arrangement is unacceptable. Of course, I do believe in the need for cooperation and coordination between the city of Portland and Multnomah County on houselessness services. And I look forward to one day voting in favor of a new contract uh, for the joint office. Um, here are seven things that I think are important uh, um, to be contained in that contract. You know, first, um, the city needs to have a proportional say in how joint office dollars are spent. 
A second, the joint office needs to end mandates that require shelters to be low barrier. Third, this IGA needs to require resources go to drug and alcohol treatment. Fourth, the joint office needs a new focus on residential drug and mental health treatment. Fifth, the joint office should forbid treatment, detox, sobering, and corrections providers from discharging clients without having a place for them to sleep. Sixth, the county should provide the city with timely access to joint office data. And finally, the county should provide the city with timely and accurate data on staffing, costs, scope of work, and assigned duties at the joint office. Um, frankly, uh, until we see a contract um, that reflects these clarifications, I will be a no in this space. However, today, the amendments that have been put on the table move this discussion forward, so I'm going to vote in favor of these amendments. Um, I hope that these discussions and this document and contract continue to evolve over the next week, because I sure hope that I can vote yes uh, when it comes back to this council in seven days. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. So I'll start by saying that I'm not hearing a lot that I disagree with, um, and so I'll, I'll add some of my comments uh, from the dialogue in, into my closing comments now. Uh, but first I want to acknowledge the amendment offered by Commissioner Ryan um, and its alignment with recent actions announced earlier this year by Chair Vega Peterson. Um, I believe there is consensus among this council um, and, and, on, and yes, our new leadership at the county on the need for data-driven um, decisions to track progress, um, increasing accountability and greater transparency, everything that we've talked about. Um, and that was the exact premise behind Chair Vega Peterson's February announcement regarding the new data task force. Um, and I also... I'm in alignment with my colleagues about wanting greater collaboration and partnership with the um, on the city's temporary alternative shelter sites with on-service uh, services, on-site services. Um, because you know, to be frank, there was no plan to provide um, houses community members with urgent interim housing options with services, and the city came up with one. Um, and next, we set out to find partners who know how to do this um, work with dignity, um, and we found that partner in Urban Alchemy. Um, a city-led effort and have seen their work in action, and I feel hopeful for that work. Um, we also found a partner in the governor, and I hope uh, that Multnomah County Board of Commissioners will join us um, in that. Um, and I'm very um, grateful and appreciative of Chair Vega Peterson's recent partnership to support the city's task work on this front. Um, I do agree uh, the underspending of the $25 million in additional revenues is far from acceptable, but uh, we do have a plan, as we heard from the mayor, and our plan is the only plan of its kind, and with the full force of support um, of every elected body in this region and our state, we can be successful in finally building a fuller continuum of support for many different individual needs and provide a pathway away from the houseless crisis and over time um, to housing for everyone who needs it. Um, I also want to add, um, because everyone is talk, uh, uh, adding this as well, that I plan to vote yes on the extension next week uh, because it's a one-year extension with opportunity to check in about the contract um, at six months, and also because I believe we do need the partnership with the county. We need better systems and investments and collaboration, and Portlanders are counting on that from us. Uh, the past may have gotten us here, but we do comprise a new constellation of leadership at every level and at every entity. And we're actively changing the past trajectory to one that is working. Um, so, and I'm hopeful for that work. And we have, you know, a time, a terminal um, band around this time for us to check in about that work. So I'm grateful to Dan Field for your comments today, for being here, for your leadership, um, which I also think will be instrumental and pivotal in this discussion. So I vote aye. Wheeler. I think we all want the Joint Office of Homeless Services to live up to its name. And I think there's broad agreement that this council would like to see full partnership around budgeting, full partnership around human resource decisions, and uh, the identification and funding of policy priorities. Where I think the value in the Joint Office also resides is around leverage. 
We have the opportunity to leverage what each of our governments is good at. The city is responsible for infrastructure, for public right-of-way management, for safety in our community and other services. By design, the county government is responsible for human services. And what's shifted in our job is that the problems we are seeing at the street level are very much human service oriented problems. And therefore, we have to pivot in the way that we deliver services to be effective on behalf of our mutual constituents, the city and the county's mutual constituents. We don't control the streams of funding. The SHS dollars go through the county. Therefore, we have to negotiate with the county to access those dollars. We had to negotiate with the governor on dollars that were also being allocated towards county government to address homelessness, and she has supported us. The governor has heard us, and the governor has thrown in in a significant way to support our efforts around the temporary alternative shelter sites. I also just want to underscore that the chair has heard our arguments around providing behavioral health services, around providing substance use disorder treatment services, around navigating people from the temporary alternative shelter sites into housing that would be specifically reserved for that population so that we can maximize the flow through of people in those sites uh, and free up spots for other people who desperately need case management and navigation to services and ultimately success in housing. We're making progress. And then in addition, just in the last few days, the chair has stepped forward and committed some of the unanticipated revenue collection towards this purpose. So I see us moving in the right direction. Do we have everything we want today? No, we do not. But this is a classic case where I don't think we should let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And again, I hear from the public loudly and clearly that unless this relationship is truly lost, keep at it. Work together because you've got the human services piece and you've got the safety and infrastructure piece and we are absolutely better together. We're stronger if we can leverage off of each other. That is my aspiration. Are we exactly where I want us to be today? No, of course not. But I see that we're moving in the right direction and I wanna give Dan a chance as well. I, I have a lot of respect for Dan and we're putting a lot of hope in one individual and, and the staff that he's in the process of assembling in the most complex space in which we all deal. And I wanna give you the opportunity to also deliver. You've heard our concerns, you bothered to come here today and, and you knew that you were gonna hear some, some frustration leveled towards this relationship and a lot of that predates you, obviously. A lot of it predates the current chair in her current role. Um, so um, that's where I am today. Dan, I appreciate, uh, Commissioner Ryan, I appreciate you bringing forward the amendment. I think there, there is broad agreement that more transparency and accountability is a must have. And uh, while I understand it's, it's still slightly um, evolving, what I've seen and what I understand of the amendment is something I can absolutely support. So I vote aye and the amendment is now uh, adopted. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading as amended. Thank you all, appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for your patience. This may be the most important thing we talk about today, so the, I appreciate those of you who have waited now over an hour patiently. Item number uh, 412, please, Keelan. Proclaim May 30th, 2023 to be Vanport Day of Remembrance. Colleagues, today we remember and bring attention to the horrific and deadly Vanport flood as we proclaim May 30th, 2023 as Vanport Remembrance Day in the city of Portland. I'd like to welcome Laura Laforte, Vanport Mosaic co-founder, to begin this morning's presentation and introduce our esteemed guests. Good morning. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. I will just take a couple of minutes because I really want all the time to be dedicated to the survivors. I thank you for this opportunity. I do want to acknowledge those who left. We had uh, Obi Hill, who is a uh, 
community historians, survivors, and, uh, and civic leaders, and a treasure. So, and his uh, daughter, Angela, they were here. So I just want to mention so that they are in our space, and I want to thank all the survivors who are here with us. I'll invite you to the Vampro Mosaic Festival, which is uh, happening as we speak. It will run until uh, May 29th with tours, screenings, and other opportunities to learn about this history and to honor the survivors who continue to contribute to our region. And with that said, I will in invite here uh, Ms. Janice Okamoto, uh, Doug Handa, and Mr. Ed Washington. Great, thank you for being here. Thanks for honoring us with your presence. Welcome. Thank you. Any order you'd prefer. Would you like to go first or? Oh. Uh, good day. I'm Jana Sokomoru, a Vanport survivor. 2023 marks the 75th anniversary of the devastating flood that destroyed Vanport, the second Oregon housing project during World War II. Our family came to Vanport for housing. About 900 Japanese Americans could not find a place to live after we were uh, the internment at Minidoka, we had to find a place to live in. Portland was still prejudiced and we had no place. So we were told that Vanport was available for housing and, and so that's where we were there. And our family was there till we were displaced again because of the flood. Of, but uh, the history and the legacy of Vanport remains for many generations and and it's a reminder that a history of Oregon. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners and uh, Mayor Wheeler. I'm proud to be here today and um, wanted to inter introduce myself as Doug Honda. It's spelled with an A, not an O, uh, Japanese pronunciation. Um, and I'd like to share my family's connection to the Vanport community. Um, I'm referred to as Sansei, which is uh, American-born, third-generation Japanese-American. And my grandmother, Izumi Oyama, was one of the 15 victims who perished in the Vanport Flood. My, my grandparents are Iwao and Izumi Oyama, and their story began when they immigrated from Japan to the United States in 1920. Like many immigrants, they were seeking a better life. They made a modest living publishing a small Portland newspaper that served the local Japanese community. Their life was, was very difficult, as you can imagine, yet they worked very hard and were driven by the optimism that the future would bring great opportunities uh, for their children and the next generation. That all came to an abrupt halt with Japan bombing Pearl Harbor and the US entering World War II. My family was forced into wartime internment or concentration camps following President Franklin Roosevelt's signing of Executive Order 9066. At that time, as you can imagine, there was a lot of wartime hysteria and they unfortunately looked like the enemy. So they suffered living in a desolate Idaho prison camp called Minidoka for the duration of the war with their children, Albert and Minnie. Minnie was my mother. And when the war ended, they returned to Portland, both broke and unwelcome by the community. Fortunately, they discovered that Vanport was one of the few areas of Portland where people from all walks of life could live and be accepted. They restarted their Japanese newspaper and their future began to look bright again. 
But once again, tragedy struck on May 30th, 1948, when my grandmother, Izumi, who was home alone that day, drowned in the Bamport flood. My mother told me her body wasn't found for many days afterwards. She was 47 years old at that time. So fast forward to today, and my family and I are so pleased to see the preservation and the sharing of the many important stories of the Vanport survivors and their descendants. So I'd like to thank you for supporting the Vanport Day of Remembrance. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and all of the council members, guests. Um, I'd just like to add a little bit to the story of the Japanese. Um, when I was living in Vanport, um, I was seven years old when I moved there and it was during the war. And not having had geography and all of those things, I. I knew that we were, the country was at war with Japan, and I thought all Japanese were in Japan. I, I never knew that there were any Japanese in Vanport until, you know, fast forward to the 1946. I remember a teacher in our classroom uh, said to us one day, she said, boys and girls, I just want you all to know that Japanese students are returning to school. But I don't remember her telling me where they had been. And um, I knew about uh, your mother as one of the victims yeah. of the flood. Um, I appreciate this proclamation because a proclamation about Vanport is so many times people have so many misunderstandings about Vanport. A lot of people, when I was growing up, they, if you talk about Vanport, they say, oh yeah, it was that, it was that old black city and it was, um, run down and it was a slum and none of those things were true none of those things were true about vanport vanport was far far more than that and that's why i'm so thankful that uh, we all have the opportunity to work with the vanport mosaic project and to keep vanport alive and i just want to close by listening to all the things that you all are dealing with in terms of housing it just made me think about how we dealt with housing after the Vanport flood. Because when we moved here in 1944, the only place that my family could live was in Vanport. There was no other options for us. And, uh, and that's where we lived. Um, but you know, on uh, the day of the flood, um, I was thinking about my, my mother, once we got out, um, we spent two nights at Oakley Green Grade School uh, the day of the flood, and, and it was really quite an experience for, I think, all the kids because there's all this stuff whenever there's an emergency. You get all these things. You get food. You get clothes. You get all this stuff. And then that Monday morning, because we spent that, that uh, Sunday night there, I remember a man getting on the stage, and he said this. He said, uh, there's a church on Northeast Russell and Rodney that will take some colored families. And we knew exactly what that meant. We had to leave Octa Green School. And we spent about three weeks at this small Lutheran church. It's gone now over on Northeast Rodney and Russell. But my mom uh, remained friends of the pastor of that church for probably the, until they passed away and they had moved back to Minnesota. After the church, my family moved, we spent the summer down on Swan Island where there were barracks for the shipyard workers, but those barracks had been cleaned up and restored and we spent the summer there. And we left Swan Island in the, summer, the fall of 1950 and moved to Giles Lake where we spent that horrible winter of 1948 and 49, and I'm telling you, it was horrible. It was cold, it was snow, it was icy, it was bad. And we lived in two trailers. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother and sister had one trailer, and my older brothers and I had another. And then from there, we 
was able to find an apartment on North Interstate. And from North Interstate, we went back to Swan Island where they had taken the barracks and really made very, very nice apartments out of them. And then um, from Swan Island, my parents were able to find a house over on Northeast Cook Street, uh, just right on the other side of the red line, in case anybody don't know what that is because it was only within that district where black people could live. And then, um, so, you know, that, so here we are 75 years later. All right. We're still struggling with it. So I just wish you all the best. But thank you so much for remembering this important place, not only to the Vanport survivors, but really to the entire city and state, uh, because Vanport was the second largest city in the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. population-wise. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you, all three of you. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Commissioner Maps. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me begin by thanking Janice, Ed, and Doug for their testimony today. And colleagues, Mr. Mayor, it's my honor to join you in declaring May 30th, 2023 to be Vanport Day of Remembrance. It is important that we remember Vanport because that lost city still has things to teach us. As we have heard today in the 1940s, Vanport was the second largest city in Oregon. And in 1948, Vanport was wiped out by a flood of biblical proportions. Today, uh, Delta Park and the Portland International Raceway occupy the land where Vanport once stood. Vanport, as we have heard, was a remarkable city. Uh, the name Vanport is a mashup of the words Vancouver and Portland. Uh, and as we have heard today, Van Poo, uh, Vanport was founded in the 1940s to house workers at the wartime Kaiser shipyards. In the 1940s, about 40,000 people lived in Vanport. Um, a poll from that decade asked families um, why they chose to move to Vanport. And the top reason that they, uh, the top reason was they thought it was their duty to go into uh, defense work. Um, it is also important to remember that about 40% of the residents of Vanport were black. Uh, now, here's how that has happened. Um, the wartime defense industry jobs in Vanport triggered a great migration of African Americans into Oregon. In terms of African Americans, it is entirely possible that Vanport was the most racially integrated city Oregon has ever seen. Now, all of that came to an end at 4.05 p.m., May 30th, 1948, when a 200-foot-long section of a railroad berm holding back the Columbia River collapsed, triggering a flood, a tragic flood, as we have learned today. By nighttime, Vancouver or Vanport was underwater, and 17,500 Vanportlanders were homeless. That flood drove many African Americans who lived in Vanport to Portland. This flood of black refugees into Portland is the beginning, I would argue, of the modern era of black politics here in Portland. 1948, in other words, is the moment when Portland began to really grapple with the cultural change needed to recognize black people, not only as full citizens of the state of Oregon. The flood of 1948 is also the moment when white Portlanders began to grapple with the cultural change that is needed to accept black Portlanders as neighbors. Now, as uh, Mr. Washington pointed out to us today, 75 years after the Vanport flood, this council and this city continue to struggle with making the cultural change needed to build a more equitable and inclusive Portland. 
Recommitting ourselves to engaging in that work is one of the ways Portlanders can participate in Vanport Remembrance Day. And there is another way Portlanders can participate in Vanport's Day of Remembrance, and that is to um, engage in some of the events associated with the Vanport Mosaic Festival. This year marks the eighth annual Vanport Mosaic Festival. The purpose of this festival is to honor and celebrate Vanport. This year, more than two dozen Vanport Mosaic events will be held throughout the city between uh, May 18th and May 29th. Events include everything from art exhibits to musical performances to educational lectures to a self-guided uh, walking tour. Um, if you are interested in participating in Vanport uh, Mosaic Festival, and I encourage you to do that, uh, just point your browser to vanportmosaic.org and you can find a schedule of events. Uh, thank you very much again to our panelists and Mr. Mayor, I'll hand the floor back to you. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, speak from the heart for a minute and just tell you how much I value you coming here today and sharing your personal stories. I mean, they were very compelling and um, this does come up once, you know, once a year, uh, but it's very, very important. It keeps the story alive and it reminds us that we did have that here. Um, and. Um, that set the, you know, it, it set some deep roots in this city that, you know, even though, you know, we struggle with um, economic justice and racial justice and a lot of these, uh, these things in our system, uh, we, we do have that capacity here because it existed um, and it's a reminder of how we need to um, keep that spirit alive. And also just wanna uh, really appreciate um, the elder voices coming and sharing directly. We're very lucky and we're very honored that, that we get to hear those stories very directly from you and also from the legacy family members as well. So um, also very proud that we live in a community where we do have these celebrations to honor um, uh, this community. Uh, but the stories are important and um, keeping it present in front of us is very important and especially for the next generation. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan, then Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, good morning. Um, similar to Commissioner Rubio, I just wanna thank you for being here. The Janice, um, Doug, and Ed, all of you told such great stories. I, hearing about your grandmother, you could really feel it coming out of your heart. And knowing your mother didn't have a mom um, for much of her life was compelling. And I feel like I've known you since, well, maybe since I was seven years old. And so that hearing, but I heard some new information from you. And I remember when we were at Portland State and you brought the Vanport Classic, you've told a lot of stories. But hearing the story, maybe for me, it sounded like the first time about that church on, um, was it Rodney and Russell? That was so compelling, so thank you for sharing that story. I really appreciate how you've single-handedly been a through line um, in my 30 years since I've been back in Portland of uplifting the Vanport story. I know my parents would always talk about it um, around Memorial Day because they lived near there in St. John's and they would tell me the story of the Henry Kaiser and that there weren't enough workers and they had to find workers and that was hence the big migration. Um, and uh, since I've been on this council, and I know that Commissioner Maps goes to meetings on this point, I often think, well, is that levy okay? I mean, that happened. And we're now experiencing the, the traditional annual snow melt. And I think we all, if you look out, the rivers are rising right now. So it makes sense that it, of course, happened during Memorial Weekend. And uh, there have been, uh, our 27 mile levee system protects 13,000 acres, eight billion of property and more than a thousand sites containing hazardous materials. So as we talk about our infrastructure crisis and challenge, I hope we also use the Vanport memory that's still alive and with such heartfelt stories to remember that we must continue to take care of that asset. A 2019 levy study by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers found that the river could rise to more than 37 feet. Vanport was 31.6 feet and major repairs totaling at least 130 million are set for 2025 to help mitigate potential flood damage from this old and aging infrastructure. So as long, as long as I'm an elected official, we'll work together to make sure that that investment happens by 2025 so we don't have to experience such hardship again. 
Anyway, thanks again for sharing your personal stories. That's what mattered the most. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to say first and foremost, thank you for keep coming and keeping history alive, sharing your stories, uh, passing it on to the next generation. I learned a lot today. I, I thought I knew the Vanport story. I, there's a lot I didn't know. Um, and uh, I would often have a grandfather talk about the risk of floods in the city of Portland and uh, just to echo some of Commissioner Ryan's points about the importance of those levees uh, didn't help us on that day in Vanport, but uh, hopefully we learned the lessons a little bit um, on infrastructure. With respect to race, however, the story of Vanport uh, really takes us back to a dark time in our history that still has scars uh, in the city of Portland. And tens of thousands of black and Japanese American men and women decided to make Portland their home, or at least make Vanport their home, and contributes to our, uh, you know, with respect to the black population, many working class that migrated during that time uh, to support the nation's efforts in World War II uh, by working in the shipyards. And the Japanese story, obviously, is a Japanese American story, is, is often forgotten in the Vanport story. Um, and I uh, just want to fully acknowledge that. But despite facing some painful challenges when the war ended, Many uh, decided to uh, either make Vanport home for the first time or stay there and continue to build a community there uh, to continue to make Oregon home. Uh, the, blood, the flood did have a disproportionate impact on our working class, on our Japanese and black Americans uh, and Portlanders. And it, it is sadly just one historic example of extreme weather events having disproportionate, disproportionate impact on our most marginalized communities our working class communities. We don't have to look that far back in history uh, to find other examples. In 2021, uh, we exp experienced the heat dome event uh, that had disproportionate impact on our working class neighborhoods in East Portland. So uh, these scars continue to push forward um, when we deal with very difficult weather events. Uh, and it's important for us as elected representatives to remember those painful events, to protect our community against future ones, um, and learn some hard lessons from them. And of course, to remember those Portlanders who face loss of their lives, livelihoods, and beloved family members. Uh, thank you for allowing us to remember and honor those folks today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I'll just say this because I'm going to read a proclamation too and I, I know everybody's been waiting. Uh, I can't thank you enough. And what I always take away from these presentations is that this is a story that's deeply personal. It's sad and it's tragic. It underscores a very dark moment in our city's history. But it is also a story of resilience. And there's a positive side to this story, and you're being here, and you're sharing your stories, and you are reminding us of the resilience of the people who were impacted and whose families were impacted, and your current role in our society today, the important role you play not only in your day-to-day your -day lives as citizens, but also, as my colleagues have indicated, as that thread that goes back through our history and reconnects us with how we got to where we are today is extremely powerful to me. And I know it's probably personally challenging to come here year after year and retell stories that are often traumatic at their heart. But I also think how important this is. And if I could go back and re-script today, I think the only thing I would have done differently is I wish we had started with this presentation with the children who were here earlier. I wish they could have heard this presentation because it's powerful. And I think it would speak to them today, even if, if they aren't aware of what happened at Vanport, uh, to hear it from you and to see that resilience over 75 years, I think would have been very inspiring to them. And so, uh, Laura, I don't know where Laura disappeared to. Uh, there's Laura over here in the wings. Um, Laura, the Mosaic Project, I think, is so critically important for just this reason. Uh, and I really appreciate you bringing that history to the present uh, because it really does help us understand a lot about our community today. And so thank you for that. 
It's my honor now to read on behalf of the City Council a proclamation that honors and remembers. Whereas our understanding of history shapes our view of the present and understand where we are going, we must understand where we're from. And whereas 2023 is the 75th anniversary of the flood that erased Vanport in a matter of hours, and whereas Vanport was once the country's largest public housing project and Oregon's second largest city with a peak population of 42,500 people, and whereas Vanport was intended as temporary housing for the war workers pouring into Portland from all over the country, supplying labor to three major shipbuilding yards. And whereas Vanport was demographically diverse with African American, Japanese American, Hispanic, Native American, Asian and white populations who all came from elsewhere to work here in our shipyards in Portland. And whereas a post-war housing shortage affected all incoming laborers, but due to Portland's discriminatory housing policies at the time, such as redlining, many of the African American workers could find no place to live because they were restricted to a small area of Portland that was already at capacity. And whereas Vanport was a city of many firsts in Oregon, including being the first to hire African American police officers and teachers. And whereas after the war, the city was also home to many Japanese Americans who had few living options when released from American concentration camps during World War II. And whereas these groups of people found themselves all strangers together and forged new connections that endured even after Vanport was gone. And whereas Vanport was constructed in the Columbia River floodplain and was protected from the river by a series of levees, and whereas exceptionally heavy snowfall in the winter of 1947-1948 and the cold springs that followed combined with the sudden warm up and rains of May to decimate the snowpack and swell the Columbia River. And whereas, although the river levels rose to alarming height over a period of weeks, the Housing Authority of Portland assured by the Army Corps of Engineers that the dikes were both strong and high enough to protect Vanport from the expected peak water levels did not order residents to evacuate. And whereas, the Housing Authority of Portland did, however, after an emergency meeting on the evening of May 29, 1948, provide a notice on some of the residents' doorsteps, telling them that they were safe at the present time, that they would have plenty of time to evacuate if there were flooding, and they should not, quote, get excited, unquote. Whereas at 4.17 p.m. the very next day, Sunday, May 30th, the Housing Authority of Portland and the Army Corps of Engineers were proven wrong when a 600-foot section of the railroad berm to the west of the city failed and water began to pour into Vanport. And whereas the flood wiped out the city in a matter of hours. Whereas at least 15 people died in the Vanport flood and 18,000 700 residents, about 6,300 of them African-American, lost their homes and most of their belongings. And whereas Vanport Mosaic will hold the eighth Vanport Mosaic Festival from May 18th to 29th to honor and celebrate Vanport as an essential and sometimes forgotten chapter in Portland's history a story that provides a template for how we can all live together and create a society that honors history, cultural contributions, and paves the way for our humanity and our city to thrive. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim May 30th, 2023, to be Vanport Day of Remembrance in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Let us remember and honor the lives affected by the Vanport flood. Learn from their experiences 
and strive to create a more inclusive and resilient city for all. Thank you. We so appreciate you being here today. Thank you all for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura, wherever you went, thank you. There you are, hiding again. Thank you. We so appreciate you. Thanks. Colleagues, do you mind if we take a five-minute break? Uh, thanks. I'm getting old and I need it. We'll, we'll recess for five minutes. Recording stopped.
413, please. Appoint Joseph Torres Ortiz to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. This is a report, colleagues. Here with us today are Samir Kanal and Dori Grabinski of the Community Safety Division to introduce this item. Welcome and thanks for your patience today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for having us. For the record, my name is Dori Grabinski, and I'm the project manager of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, also known as PSEP. We are housed in the Advisory Boards and Commissions Unit in the Community Safety Division. As you know, PSEP is a mayoral committee tasked with independently assessing how the city is progressing with the remedies in the United States versus City of Portland Settlement Agreement. PSEP also offers community members a chance to give input on a broad range of issues related to policing in Portland and makes recommendations to the mayor and chief of police. PSEP has a total of 13 seats, two of which are reserved for youth members. At present, our membership sits at 11 with the two youth seats vacant. We are here today to request the appointment of a youth member to fill one of those vacancies. <coughs> I will now pass it to PSEP co-chair, Pastor Robin Wisner, who has some additional comments about the committee's work and this appointment. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is Pastor Robin Wisner, and I am one of the PSEP co-chairs. Since the summer of 2022, PSEP staff and members have been working hard to bring community back into compliance and just as importantly, provide an exclusive place for community engagement about policing in our city. We have made tremendous progress and are very proud of the work that we have done. Our plans for this summer and beyond, including having more in-persons and hybrid community engagement events so we can truly diversify our group of Portlanders. We also have a plan of engaging more with the Portland Police Bureau policy review process. This is always more work. There is always more work to do. But today we are hope that we have taken the, the right step directly by adding a youth member to our community, our committee. The perspective of our young generation is vital in advancing the goals of the settlement agreement. And we're excited to welcome Mr. Torres. And I'll pass it back to Dory. Great. So our candidate for peace of appointment is also here with us today. Joseph Torres Ortiz is a leader in the community who plans to become a social studies educator. As a PSEP member, Joseph looks forward to learning more about the process around the settlement agreement and empowering others in the community to learn alongside him. Um, so I will now invite Joseph to introduce himself. Good afternoon. afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Joseph Torres Ortiz. I'm a Portland native that is currently pursuing my master's in education <laughs> at Portland State University with the goal of teaching social studies. I'm passionate about social change and empowering my community. I currently work for a nonprofit in Portland that serves youth and families. As a leader, I'm dedicated to promoting equity and creating a more just society. And with that being said, I joined PSEP to gain a better understanding of how our police engages with Portland's most underprivileged citizens. Overall, I want PPV to be more equitable, responsible, and fair to everyone. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Appreciate you. Colleagues, any questions? And just for the record, Chris, we don't have testimony in this, do we? Uh, we do. We have one person signed up. Okay. Uh, I, I have a couple of comments, but why don't we hear public testimony first? Uh, first, we have, or first and only, we have Mark Porras. Very good. Mark, welcome. Yep. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Um, when you appointed two new members to PSEP, the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, on February 15th, um, we said we had no problem with the appointments, and we noted that there were still two open seats. Uh, we also have no problem with Joseph Torres Ortiz's appointment today. 
Uh, however, we're concerned that since he's a graduate student and PCEP's youth seats are restricted to people aged 16 through 24, um, that his tenure as a youth member will not last very long. Um, we're also concerned that even with this appointment, there's still one empty seat to fill on PCEP, which brings us back to the issue that we've raised continuously, which is that PCEP and, and other city bodies should set their quorum to a majority of seated members. So for instance, while PCEP has only had 11 members these last several months, their quorum should have been six members instead of seven. And um, leaving the quorum the way it's defined by the number of total seats has not made city council fill the empty seats any faster. It's only hampered PCEP's ability to do its work. And we also note that the compliance officer has reported repeatedly about how PCEP has had a full contingent of 13 members since last fall, uh, though the two previously appointed youth members attended few, if any, meetings. Another person's um, term expired and uh, um, other people have resigned. Uh, PCEP used to have a pool of alternates who could step up if seats opened up, and perhaps it's time to revive that practice. Thank you. That's all I've got. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and, I, and I'll, I'll just uh, respond to what you've said. Um, I, you know, personally, I would not support a quorum with no minimum. At, at some point, you run the risk, obviously, of having a very few number of people making decisions on behalf of what's supposed to be a larger and more comprehensive advisory body. Uh, but but I don't know. I mean, I, I'm certainly open to the idea of uh, changing the quorum rules, but with a floor you know, that, that it must include at least a certain number of people. Um, you know, you can toy with that, talk amongst your friends and colleagues and see if there's a there there. But I, I'm not opposed to that. Just you know, FYI. Um, and uh, with regard to the shortness of tenure as youth, uh, all of us had short tenures. <laughs> as youth. I don't even remember mine for the most part, um, but I, I applaud you, Mr. Ortiz, for stepping up and being willing to do this. And by the way, I'm really interested that you want to be an educator, and in particular in social studies. Um, you know, we, we have one historian here on our city council, uh, and I'm just curious, what, what motivated you to want to be an educator? That's a tough job. Um, I come from a family of educators. I have two um, family members that are, uh, well, one of them moved, but my uncle, Esteban Ortiz, is an educator at uh, McDaniel High School. Okay. Um, he's one of my biggest role models, and um, one of the reasons why I want to be an educator. Um, I'm also, I, I want to be a role model in my community. I, I just, I want to be that inspiration for youth. And um, social studies is, is uh, pretty broad. It's not just about history, um, but there's a lot of things that go into social studies. And um, yeah, I, I just I have a passion to just be that person um, and inspire change. Great. Uh, well, f first of all, let me just enthusiastically say I appreciate you and I appreciate your perspective. You have a spark about you and I, I like that. Uh, your experience is, is very good for what we're looking at. I appreciate your willingness to step up and serve. As you know, the pay is lousy. The hours are long. Um, but other than that, it's a great gig if you can get it. Um, but the, the truth is, as Mark indicated, this, this is a really important body. And uh, the work can be intense at times. And I think the perspective you bring is a unique one and a really important one. So I'm, I'm glad you're willing to step forward. Colleagues, any other? Questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Any second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds the approval of the report. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Good to see you, Pastor Weiser, and thank you, Joseph, for offering to serve. Your service is needed and wanted. And like the mayor said, just knowing your passion for teaching uh, was inspiring. Your insights into this complicated work are so needed and wanted. Thanks. Aye. Gonzalez. Mucho gusto, Joseph, and thank you so much for your willingness to serve. I vote aye. Maps. Uh, Joseph, thank you for agreeing to serve on this important committee. I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here, and of course, Pastor Weiser, it's always great to see you. Um, wonderful to see you and hear your words and comments about the great work of PCEP, um, and thanks to all of your service to community. Joseph, I'm very excited for you to join, not only because of your perspective about, um, you know, 
education, but also, and youth, uh, but also because um, you're a young leader in the Latine community, and that's really important for our community right now. So we need your voice, um, and I'm really grateful that you're serving. I vote aye. Wheeler. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Ortiz. We, we appreciate it, and thank you uh, for bringing us a, a really solid candidate. I'm, I'm excited about what you can bring to the discussion. Thank you. I vote aye, and the report is approved, and the appointment's approved as well. Thank you, and best of luck to you. You. May I say this? Yes, of course. On the proclamation that you did for Vanport Remembrance Day, I was very moved and very, very, very satisfied with the historical bringing it out as well as being able to have that a day of remembrance here in the city. Thank you guys so much for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item, please, is item 414. It's an emergency ordinance. Approved grant renewal funding recommendations by Portland Children's Levy Allocation Committee for July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. I'll start by thanking Portland voters for supporting the fourth renewal of the Portland Children's Levy, which passed last week by 70%. I'm heartened to see investments in our children chosen once again and again, especially in the wake of a pandemic that fell so heavily on children and youth education. The levy is seeking council approval on renewal grants recommended by the levy's allocation committee, which I sit on with four other esteemed colleagues, including um, Chair Vega Peterson. <clears throat> These grants will continue early childhood, childhood abuse prevention, foster care, after school programming, mentoring, hunger relief services for the next two years. Lisa Pellegrino, Levy Director, and Joel Broussard, Grant Manager, are here, um, and, and, and also you, John. <laughs> but that wasn't in my notes, so it's wonderful to have you here as well. Take it away, Lisa. Thanks, Commissioner Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Commissioner Ryan said, we are here requesting approval of the Allocation Committee's recommendations for grant renewals. Um, and to remind you all of the committee, if you can have the first slide, that'd be great. Um, the first slide as, uh, just shows the members of the committee that made these decisions that are before you, Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Jacob, uh, Jessica Vega peterson as he mentioned, and also Tracy Rossi, who is the city-appointed citizen member of the Allocation Committee, and Felicia Tripp Folsom, who is the county-appointed citizen member of the committee. There's too many C's there. Um, Mitch Horniker, which is the, the um, representative of the business community. So that's the, the committee that made these decisions that are before you today. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the levy funding cycle, um, just to review, because not everybody has been on the council since we were before you with these recommendations. Um, after the voters approve a levy, um, PCL runs a competitive grant round um, and makes three-year initial grants with an opportunity for renewal that's based on performance. We give these multi-year grants based on very consistent feedback that emphasizes the need for stabilizing funding that's providing really key services for community and also helps organizations leverage additional funding when they have that stable funding. So that's sort of the, the process that we go through. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna um, briefly review our process that, we're, that you all, um, that, I'm sorry, start again. <laughs> the grants were recommended today for renewal um, were initially funded in 1920, um, competitive grant round for large grants, and I was just gonna briefly review that process that we went through to make the initial grants that these are now extensions of. Um, so the first step in that process is to prepare a local data report where we summarize what's going on with children and families in our community, and we use that to frame um, the funding application and to outline what the current conditions that children and families are facing in the community. Um, next, we do um, about a year-long community engagement process um, to understand what community needs and priorities are for funding. Last time, we worked with Empress Rules Equity Consulting to design and implement that process. Um, they surveyed community members um, and also service providers and conducted fo focus groups. Um, to try to understand what the most pressing needs were and how, what kind of programming PCL should be funding. Um, the other thing we did last time was to engage PSU's Center for Improvement on Children and Family Services to review our grant making process and make recommendations for improvement. Um, those recommendations focused on improving equity and transparency throughout the process, um, and we redesigned our funding application to focus on the equity, diversity, and inclusion practices of applicants. So that's kind of the, the pre-process that we go through. Next slide, please. 
And then we issue the funding applications in the six program areas that Commissioner Ryan referenced in his remarks. Um, we work with and we recruit um, community reviewers to review the funding applications. Um, four to five reviewers score each application. And then the allocation committee considers the scores for the applications, the staff funding recommendations, and the applicant testimony to make their final decisions. Um, the allocation committee made the funding recommendations that were approved by city council for these grants that are now before you in May 2020. Um, and now they, we are here for performance-based renewals for two years. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill Brassard, who's on my far right, um, to talk you through the process that we use to consider renewals that are here today. Thank you, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about the grant renewal uh, process. Uh, all current grant grantees were eligible to receive a two-year renewal grant. Re renewal grants are made to allow grantee partners to continue delivering the same or substantial similar services to the community. At the February EC meeting, staff presented the renewal grant funding formula, which took into account projected resources in the January revenue forecast and higher than average inflation rates at that time. The base used for calculating the grant renewal amount is 40% of the three-year grant award plus a 4% compounded COLA on the base amount. Where grantees were not able to return to pre-pandemic service levels, staff may recommend reduced funding. After the February meeting, staff communicated the renewal process and funding formula to grantees. Next slide, please. In February and March, staff reviewed grantees' mid-year progress reports and saw positive trends overall, one of which 83% of grantees were on track at that time to meet goals for the number of people served. Two, 78% of grantees were on track to meet at least half of service activity delivery goals that they had. And third, grant spending was much closer to pre-pandemic rates. One particular cha challenge, which was consistent throughout the pandemic and continues to remain so, is 64% of the grantees reported ongoing staffing challenges. Next slide, please. In March and April of 23, we met with grantees to discuss results in any performance concerns. We developed and sent renewal recommendations to those grantees by the end of March, uh, on March 31st. Grantees had the option to send written response to staff recommendations, and then staff recommendations and grantee written responses were sent to the allocation committee at the beginning of April. Next slide, please. After reviewing staff recommendations and grantee responses, the allocation committee has recommended 76 of the 80 large grants for renewal at the full formula. Reduced funding for three of grants where programs have not been able to return to pre-pandemic service levels entrance were not positive that they could. And then one grant declined renewal due to ongoing staffing shortages in the child care and preschool sector. That concludes our presentation. Any questions from the council on the allocation committee recommendations? Colleagues, any questions? All right, very good. And does that complete your testimony? Short that does. John was just here in case there happened to be any money questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it, all three of you. Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right, very good. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Brian. Yeah, thanks for being a North Star on how we work with community uh, when it comes to our granting from the city. I really appreciate it, and I vote aye. Gonzalez. Appreciate your stewardship. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, thank you for all your work and your dedication to Portland families and children. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well-oiled machine as per usual. Thank you. <laughs> I vote aye. Thank you. The new ordinance is adopted. Appreciate thank you, your council members. Leadership. Item 415, this is a second reading. And thanks for your patience. Authorized competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder for construction of the Mount Scott Community Center Seismic retrofit and expansion project for an estimated cost of 28300000 Colleagues, this is the second reading. We've already heard a presentation and had opportunity for public testimony. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. 
Brian. Robin, thank you for your leadership and a lot of appreciation for the work being done by Adam McGowan, the Mount Scott's director. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Thank you, Robin. I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted 416, also a second read. Authorize eight grant or intergovernmental agreements related to the Community Watershed Stewardship Program for a total amount up to $100,000. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I didn't know much about this project. I thought it was really interesting and very worthwhile. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. 417, a second reading. Authorize intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County Health Department for $129,000 to conduct lead-related public health services for the Lead Hazard Reduction Program. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Brian. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted 418. This is a non-emergency ordinance. Amend permit fee schedules for building, cannabis, electrical, enforcement, land use services, mechanical, noise, Plumbing, signs, site development, and land use services fee schedule for the hearings office. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Today we have before us the proposed fee changes for the Bureau of Development Services. BDS is responsible for administering and enforcing the state building code, as well as administering and enforcing the city's zoning code, Title 33, and regulations on floating structures, Title 28, erosion control, Title 10, Signs, Title 32, Murals, Title 4, Property Maintenance, Title 29, Portions of the Tree Code, Title 11, Noise Control, Title 18, Liquor Licensing, Chapter 14B, 120, and Marijuana Licensing, Chapter 14B, 130. 98% of BDS's ongoing funds come from permit fees and charges for service. Fees need to be set as a rate, at a rate to cover the cost of providing these services. BDS revenues and reserve levels have declined in the past year while costs continue to rise due to the inflationary economic environment. The rising cost of providing services are due to increases in personnel costs from cost of living adjustments, merit and step pay increases, mandatory PERS contribution increases, costs associated with implementing crucial technology needed to provide online services and capacity to dedicate time to process improvement projects as well as inflation and costs of materials and of materials and services. Fees from BDS programs administering the state building code are regulated by state law which prohibit revenues from one program being used to fund another other local programs such as administration of the zoning code, sign code and tree code. The ability for BDS to provide timely, predictable services is essential in keeping the construction industry working, adding to the housing supply, supporting business development, and attracting investment in Portland. The fee changes proposed today are necessary to maintain uh, stability, implement important process and technology uh, improvement work to deliver online resources services, and to shorten permitting timelines and keep up with the cost of inflation. These fee changes will help the Bureau maintain a stable workforce that is especially critical in this housing crisis for positioning the Bureau to increase in demand for services. With this today, our BDS Deputy Director Elshad and BDS uh, Budget and Finance Manager Kyle to provide additional background and inf information about the proposal. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for excellent introduction. I'm Elshad Hajiev, uh, BDS Deputy Director. Um, BDS is, as uh, Commissioner uh, Rubio mentioned, is 98% uh, funded through fees uh, from our permit uh, fees and for the charges of services. And we are required to maintain cost recovery, 100% cost recovery. So our revenues um, need to um, uh, fully cover our, all of our expenditures. And then in the recent year, we have uh, pressures on both sides, on the expenditure side and on the revenue side. As Commissioner uh, Rubio mentioned, um, as far as the hour expenditure goes, um, more than 70% of our expenditures are labor costs. It's a personnel cost. And um, um, we are all aware of the um, colors uh, of the um, um, uh, increases that are associated with the labor agreements and then merit pay increases and then purse contributions, they rise every year. And also there is an additional inflation in non-labor related uh, material and costs. 
We also, what we're witnessing right now, it's also on the other side, on the revenue side, we see a decrease in revenues. Um, um, a, a large portion of our permits, predominant uh, majority of our revenues um, are based on the, um, uh, the valuation of the projects. Um, large, expensive commercial projects, they bring a lot more revenue than the projects that are smaller, like, for example, a new house or a residential remodel. And we're very in, in, in the very interesting uh, time uh, where the mix of projects has changed, and we're seeing a lot uh, fewer larger commercial projects and a lot more smaller projects that are coming in. So um, the workload still remains high because we, we get those smaller projects. However, there is a pressure on our revenues. Um, a development of um, large projects like an, um, offices, hotels, uh, apartments ex is expected to be low for a, at least a couple of years. Um, and um, the construction industry overall, and you've heard that in our budget presentations and, and also on the, um, May 12th uh, work session, that um, uh, they're dealing with the high interest rates, um, also high cost for labor and materials. Um, they also are uh, dealing with a lot of uncertainty. And then there is another factor that kind of a plays into um, um, that, that pressure on, on the revenue side is the, uh, the lending market is not, does not really see Port, uh, sees Portland as, as risky compared to um, other cities on the West Coast, other cities across the country uh, of the similar size, and even riskier than the, um, the Hillsborough or Beaverton or Vancouver on the other side uh, of the river. So um, it's, it's difficult for uh, developers to get financing right now, especially for, the, for those larger projects that, br that bring a lot of revenue. Um, currently, a lot of our fees are um, um, they're, uh, below the 100% the, the cost recovery. So this is the process that we go every year to make sure that our fees are adjusted so we can we can cope with the ongoing cost of inflation and uh, continue providing um, services. And even if those changes, we still are not, without those proposed changes, we still are not at the 100% cost recovery. However, we're very cognizant of the impact that on the construction industry, so we wanna make sure that those fee changes are gradual. It's not like a big increase on our, um, um, on our fees. Um, when we have enough sufficient funding and staffing to meet those workload demands, we're better able to provide timely and efficient services. And also, like Commissioner Rubio mentioned, also expand our online presence and provide new and enhanced services to our customers. And you all know that when we have new buildings coming on, that there is a multiplier, a multiplier effect. You have a one building coming on, suddenly you have shops around it, you have food carts, you have small businesses coming in. So there is, there is this multiplier effect that is, uh, that is uh, associated with um, um, new buildings, housing, shops, restaurants, schools. So it's, it's um, um, grocery stores, social events. Um, Um, all these fee increases are assumed in our five-year financial plan and also part of our budget's uh, submission. And th as I mentioned, we are keeping those fee increases as, as gradual and as, as low as possible so that it's not uh, creating a disincentive to our customers seeking service. And um, our goal is that work is permitted, so we do offer low-income fee waivers as needed particularly when we're working to bring a property into compliance with life and safety regulations. So to summarize the goals of this uh, ordinance of this fee change is uh, to provide fund needed to maintain staffing, cap staffing capacity to support BDS services, including technology support, um, and then uh, keep up with the rising costs. And again, I, I, we, we talked about uh, the specifically labor costs. Uh, overall, the summary is that we're pro proposing 5% increase across most of our programs. Some of our fees might be a little bit, uh, the, the increase might be a little bit higher. Some of the fees are not being increased at all. So, uh, and um, these fee changes affect building, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, site development, science enforcement, land use services, hearings officer, noise, and cannabis licensing uh, fee schedules. 
Um, we did, um, a, a, we do a very broad outreach with uh, informing our customers about these fee changes. Uh, one of the venues that we use very intensively is Development Review Advisory Committee. We also reached out to Boma, NAOP, um, HBA, so they are aware of those fee increases. And um, I wouldn't, um, I, I would, I would not go as far as that they fully support it, but uh, they understand why we are raising our fees. And um, all of our managers, they reached out to those key industry groups to inform them. Um, the um, notification has been posted on our website. Um, that actually concludes our presentation, and we're open to um, Can I ask questions. a clarifying question? Absolutely. I, I, I think I heard you correctly, but I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. So this fee increase is fairly narrowly paid by developers who want to get their permitting through BDS. Is that a fair way of presenting this? Uh, th this fee increase is just to maintain the kind of a status quo right now. We're not- Okay, but it's, it's, it, it's the, the purpose here is to support the permitting process, correct? correct? Absolutely. And, and so in a sense, it is a pay as you go for people who are seeking permits in the city of Portland. And it sounds like, you know, I've heard from many of them personally, and what I hear from them is they want the process to be efficient, they want it sped up. So it sounds like this is sort of a quid pro quo. The industry will pay slightly more, but in exchange they expect better, faster service. Is that a fair way of characterizing this? It is, so with a one caveat, if it's not approved, because again, 98% of our funding is coming from fees, most likely it will it will result in a reduction on our workforce. Uh, yeah, I understand. Th that I'm, reduction I'm, I'm saying in the yes. affirmative, that's yes. how this is to be used. Correct. Okay, and Correct. I, I, I'm saying this, colleagues, to underscore what's perhaps an obvious point. This is different than what we've been discussing in terms of broad-based taxes and fee and rate increases. This is a fairly specific group of people, or a group of organizations paying it for very specific services delivered to those same set organizations. And I have heard from them that this is something they want because they're expecting you to use those revenues Correct. to improve the service that they say needs to be improved. So I, I just want to That's an excellent description, that Mayor. Thank you. Uh, sometimes, you know what, I succeed. Anything else? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Mr. Maps, go for it. Um, what's the field issuance remodel program? Um, that's the program that is um, um, focused on the residential remodel where we provide um, uh, more expansive services to our customers. There is um, um, inspector, one inspector assigned to um, a, a group of um, residential remodelers. So it's, it's a very kind of a niche program. There is a fee associated with that to be in that program. Uh, we charge hourly fee on those so that the, the, um, uh, the usual building permit fee schedule doesn't apply. So it's, it's a, a fee-based program. There is an, a kind of a concierge service. So for example, the, you know, if I'm, I'm, I'm a residential contractor, I can call that inspector with any questions that I have about my project, and they pay extra. So there is, an, there is a fee associated with that. This is a program uh, along with the um, FPP, which is a um, similar program, but on the commercial side, are very popular programs. We have actually a waiting list to get on to the each program, but we, we don't have resources um, um, to fully accept everybody into those two programs, but very popular, very um, 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 well-regarded. Both programs are well-regarded across the, both commercial and residential contractors. Um, thank you. That, that, that's a helpful clarification. So um, I asked because I'm looking at your fee schedule for different programs, building mechanical, cannabis licensing, electrical. Yeah. Uh, all of these have 5% fee increases yeah. except for the field issuance remodel program, which has a 9%. Yes. Um, why did you make that choice? We did an analysis of the program as far as, again, that program also needs to cover the costs. So, and what we realized that the long term, they're not covering their costs to the 100% to the cost recovery. So um, that's why we are kind of a gradually increasing that hourly fee to bring them to that 100% cost recovery. So they're a little bit, little bit um, worse off, I would say, than the, than the rest of the programs in the Bureau. That's why the increase is slightly higher. Okay. And, um, 
You said these fees uh, um, don't achieve cost recovery um, for the most part. Um, and how do you make this pencil out? Uh, uh, um, so if you are not, if you are spending more than you're bringing in, um, why aren't you bankrupt? Uh, we have a very healthy reserve, so and we built that reserve during the construction boom. So uh, when there were, you, we've seen all those cranes around the city. So we we had an influx of the large commercial projects, and these are the times when we built that reserve. And um, um, a lot of you are familiar with the history of the bureau in 2008 crisis when we had to lay off more than half. Of of our um, workforce. So since then, we, we developed um, uh, measures in place that advise us, like um, we have a business continuity plan uh, that this council actually did look into, I think it was 2009 or 2010, and it was adopted by the council. So there are measures that we're looking, um, we're monitoring on a, on a monthly basis to kind of up to advise us as far as if the winds are changing, basically. So, um, we, uh, we, we do forecasting, we, we look at um, all, of the, all of our programs, uh, some of them separately, some of them we combine in our forecasting models, and then we do five-year forecast. So um, our funding is, is really kind of, there's, there's the, the revenue and there's this rainy day fund, and right now we're using that rainy day fund because it takes so much time and money and resources to train employees to be productive. On average, um, I would say that for our uh, plans examiners, employees who review plans or inspectors, it takes six to nine months from the date of hire to bring them up to speed, right? So we, 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 we have a very talented workforce. And in, in, in times like this, we, we, we are gonna use those reserves to make sure that we preserve that workforce. That's why you know, I haven't touched a lot on the uh, permit improvement task force and, and, and uh, improvements in technology. So in these times, we kind of, uh, we, we also refocus. We look at the ways how we can improve our services. So um, that reserve allow, allows us to do that. And right now, uh, we have approximately $47 million there. Uh, we are projected to draw approximately, if I'm not mistaken, 13? Yeah, almost 14 million. Almost 14 uh, million dollars next year, even with those fee changes, because again, we're expecting that the construction will not be at the levels that will, will be, well, that, where we will be able to achieve that 100% cost recovery. But again, letting go of a talented workforce, it has implications that are, that they span 2008 was, what, 15 years ago. We're still feeling that. Right. So we cannot allow that force to, to, to go. We have to support them. We have to make sure that they're still employed, that, um, that there's a workload for them, uh, and, and, and we can you know, um, uh, maintain them and kind of write that sure. down, downward way. Great. Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, two more questions. One, just a, clarif a clarification. So I understand you guys don't do cost recovery on uh, fees here, but you do have a reserve and you're drawing on the reserve. Maybe you got 47 million uh, in reserve and you've, um, like, I think I heard that you said next year or this year you're going to draw on about 15 million. We're projecting to draw down almost $14 million next year. That's if we get the fee changes approved by council. In the year after that, it would be around 11 or so, 11, 12 million, if the fee changes are approved by council. These fee changes represent about $3 million in, in revenue. Sure. And what happens year three? It's, I, I'm, I'm doing the math in my head to figure out how, how much uh, runway you guys have left. We, um, if we don't get the fee changes approved by council, um, we wouldn't be able to reach, achieve cost recovery. Um, in the later years of our forecast. So we'd be looking at drawing down our reserves completely by fiscal year 26, 27. Um, and, and, and just one caveat. Yeah. Uh, when we do financial projections, we assume that the current conditions will persist, right? So for example, we have a lot of risks in the horizon and also there are a lot of unknowns that may unveil, unveil themselves in the year two of the forecast. So there might be, um, 
I'm, I'm just going to go positive and say that suddenly Portland recovers the reputation and there is a lot of tourists coming in and everything is revived. So our forecast will change. If, if that is going to come true, then our forecast is going to change next year and we're going to recalibrate the next five years. So we do that every year. And we, we refresh our models every at least twice a year. We refresh them at the end of the fiscal year and in the middle of the next fiscal year. So. Um, yeah, we, we do a lot of work, again, because the, the, the funding, the, the way the Bureau is funded, we, we operate like business, basically. We have to make sure that we have enough money coming in, we have enough money in the bank to make sure that we continue to provide uh, our services to, uh, to the community. Uh, um, thank you. Um, it's very helpful and very interesting to me. Uh, PBOT and uh, BDS are different beasts, but there are many similar uh, dynamics in many ways. Just as a warning to uh, the commissioner in charge of my colleagues, in many ways, you folks seem to be about, or potentially, are about three years behind uh, PBOT, where PBOT survived the pandemic by while drawing on our reserves, will blow through our reserves by the end of this year, and then it's... Uh, um, it's a difficult space. One last, speaking of difficult uh, um, spaces, one last question. Um, you, uh, uh, in your presentation, you um, indicated that I, I suspect the financial markets um, or banks view Portland as being risky. Riskier. Yes. Riskier. What does that mean? And why would Portland be riskier than like Hillsboro, I think you cited, maybe, or Beaverton? I forget what the other cases that you talked about. You won't. Sure. Um, it, it's not just banks, it's um, developers as well. They're, they're looking at institutional investors are not just regional but nationwide, and they have to choose where they put their pot of money. And I think um, in they could put some in Portland, but it, they could also go up to Seattle or Spokane or down to Sacramento. They can go really anywhere with it. Um, and. Portland hasn't had the best press in the last few years, and uh, there have been, you know, some uh, rankings in terms of the perception of Portland as a place to develop uh, over the past few years. And a few years ago, we were at the top of the list; we were number three. And it, what we heard in our advisory committee from some folks that are in the know that we've dropped significantly, and out of 80 cities, we're now in the bottom quartile, um, in 66 or, or so. So. The perception from the outside, at least, of Portland has dropped significantly in the past several years, uh, impacting where developers choose to put their money in, and the bank's choice to lend to them. And then, uh, go ahead. And that, that pot of money, unfortunately, is also shrinking because of the higher interest rates. Yeah. So they're, they're more kind of a selective as far as where they want to put that money. So, and then that's why, you know, Portland is kind of not, not at the top of the list. And I think it was yesterday or the day before, um, there was another ranking that came out. Um, kind of, they, they ranked them as a cold or hot economies, and we were, f I think, f fifths from the bottom, the cold. So, and I don't know how, they, if, how scientific their right. studies or rankings are, but we are kind of seeing the impact of those studies on the, the, the type and the number of permits that are coming in. Um, thank you for that, um, frankly, uh, grim assessment of uh, how Portland is viewed. Um, I'll just uh, pivot to my colleagues and say I, I hope that at some point over the summer maybe we can have a work session or create um, some space to um, explore um, uh, and identity to explore and get a better understanding of the factors that make Portland a um, a risky place or. So we should have a discussion about why uh, um, developers and bankers and other folks perceive us to be uh, particularly ri uh, risky, um, and I hope that we can use that discussion to um, Im implement policy changes that make uh, Portland a more attractive place to start a business and grow a business and whatnot. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioner Rubio. I have no further questions. I'll hand the floor back to you. Great. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I just want, and this may be as much a question for my colleagues, but just thinking through the caps we put on, or what we did with SDCs last week, and looking at these fee increases, I'm, 
I guess the question is really an architecture one as we're looking at adjustments in prices at a in an era of real inflation uh, that is driving our cost, obviously, and, and, and driving the cost of the cost of our residents and developers who want to build in the city. Um, the and I'm just trying to it's sort of an open ended question, but reconcile if we're capping SDCs, which is essentially what we did last week, but pushing somewhat modest, but but still real um, rate increases here. In your own minds, how do you reconcile those two actions? Uh, absolutely. I, I think there is a big difference between SDCs and uh, the, the fees that we're presenting today. Um, the fees that we're presenting today are the, for the services that we're providing right now. So when someone walks in into the uh, DAC or schedules an online appointment and they apply for a permit, th those services are provided immediately, right? We review the permit, we review the plans, but then later on, um, depending on the project, maybe up to six months, we do the inspection. So, and we incur those costs almost immediately. SDCs, the costs are not most of them, and I, I I'm, I'm speaking from my understanding of SDCs, but the, but the costs are not incurred immediately. The costs are kind of in the future, right? So there is no immediate today impact on the staffing levels or um, on, 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 the, on the financial situation of the Bureau. With our fees, there is. The impact is immediate. Like Kyle was saying, if, if these fees are, fee changes are not approved, it means that we will have uh, $3 million less Three million dollars is approximately fifteen to twenty positions, so that's that that could have an impact on a, on a, on the provision of immediate services to our community. So that that's kind of a to me is a conceptual difference between SDC, the freeze on SDCs versus moving forward with the fee changes on uh, for BDS fees. But just to follow that logic, if we're capping SDCs, we're not staying up with inflation. At some point in, the, you know, at some point in the future, we are going to have a come to Jesus moment, for lack of a better term, right? If we're not, if our revenue isn't consistent or isn't staying up with with inflation, eventually, presumably, that does lead to position cuts. My, I, I, I agree. My personal opinion: we we just kind of moved it to the future. We, you know, if, 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 if the fee changes for SDCs were warranted because of the inflation and the freeze happened from kind of a more financial point of view, we basically move that issue into the, from, the, from present to the future. So you're right, it, it, it just doesn't disappear, right? And I don't believe that we will experience any, um, at least at this point, any years of deflation, right? So, so far, it looks like um, at least the, the latest was like 3% or 4% that we're, that we're expecting in future years. So. Got it. And one last question. I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but when we did, uh, when we talk about SDCs, uh, the whole pie, what percentage of SDCs go to BDS in a typical development? BDS doesn't collect any SDCs. So that, that's why I, I prefaced my my answers to your questions that I'm not I'm not fully versed in STC, so that's my, my personal understanding. But we do not collect any STCs. All of our fees are are, are fees for service that is provided um, at the time of the application, or at the time of the inspection, or at the time of the plan review. So the the, the impact on a customer is immediate. Basically, if if we if we scale down our services, then our timelines will be longer. Uh, we won't be uh, do as many inspections per day as we're doing right now, for example. So the impact will be immediate. With SDCs, like you, like you said, we, we just moved it to the future. And, there will and, be impact. Got it. And I, I guess this is, again, just an observation. We took steps last week to assure that we're removing barriers, that we're not standing in the way of development at a very difficult time in the city's history. Um, we, in some senses, externalize that to other bureaus to bear the burden of that in some respects, at, at least in the future. Um, and 
I just want to make sure when we're approaching fees that we're doing it with an architecture that makes sense and uh, uh, that we're doing it in somewhat a consistent way. But um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Elshad, Kyle, it's good to see you. Um, I kind of know this topic for, very well because we were in the some really scary times in 2020 and 21 on this, and you really helped educate me on the crisis that we had to avoid, that we experienced. So we have lived experience that what happened after the Great Recession really dismantled BDS, and we just can't ever get back to that place. So thank you for making that point very clearly. There's a new uh, tax, if you will, or fee, and that's cannabis. And um, I promised a dear friend who owns one of those uh, retail outlets to just ask a couple of questions. I was told we have really high fees in comparison to other states and other cities. And so I just wanted to put that out. I think our statewide rate is 17%, um, and then it keeps going up 5% every year. They're having a really hard time. A lot, a lot of it is like a lot of our small businesses, they've been spending a lot of money on security. And um, so th I did get um, lobbied, if you will, to uh, please um, acknowledge that the cannabis fee in general is really um, challenging for some of our retail outlets right now. So I wanna make sure in the first reading I put that into the public record. Thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. Is there any public testimony on this item? Yes, we have two individuals signed up. Three uh, minutes each, name for the record. First is Andrew Morrow. Welcome. They were planning to join virtually. I don't think they've joined us. Uh, next is Wade Lange. There he is. Thanks for your patience. Oh, it was a pleasure watching back there. What a morning. Yeah, a lot of interesting things for sure. Made me proud to be a Portlander. Good to you to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Wade Lang, and I'm here in my role as an ex interim executive director of the Building Owners and Managers Association of Oregon, or BOMA. Um, BOMA represents over 50 million square feet of office, medical, industrial space within the state, primarily within the metro area. We are part of the commercial real estate industry that testified in 2020 about our concerns over BDS budget cuts and staff reductions. We appear here today for those same reasons. There's been a dramatic reduction in development and construction projects over the last three years. Because BDS budget is based on fees for such development and construction, and BDS continues to draw from its reserves, we are once again fearful of more staff reductions throughout the Bureau. Reduced staffing directly affects the timing, cost of commercial construction projects. Delays in development or construction can kill projects at a time when our city desperately needs to see new and continued investment. The impact of delayed or canceled projects has a ripple effect throughout the region, affecting not just individual projects or commercial buildings, but also the vendors contracted to work in those buildings, the businesses who utilize them, and the construction industry in general. We believe there is a potential turnaround coming for Portland, bringing new projects that will have positive economic impacts for the entire metro region. But only if projects are assured a reasonable path of implementation there's more than just affordable housing needed for Portland to recover, and we need BDS to be available and able to serve us all. Therefore, BOMA is in support of those fee increases necessary to reduce or stop the draw on the reserves and the reduction in BDS employees. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. And Christina, was there somebody else? Or they, they didn't show up, is that They correct? didn't show in Zoom. That completes testimony. All right, good. Anything else on this particular item? This is a non-emergency item. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, please, 419. Authorize intergovernmental agreement with regional disaster preparedness organization to allow building-related stranded workers to work in the jurisdiction where they are stranded due to an emergency that disrupts communications and transportation routes. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Colleagues, today I'm requesting that Council adopt this ordinance to enable BDS uh, sign a building-related stranded worker agreement, or SWAG. The purpose of the Stranded Worker International Intergovernmental Agreement is to authorize and establish conditions for sharing building-related stranded workers within the five-county Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization region. 
during a building safety emergency. SWAGs allow stranded workers to contribute their skills to whatever jurisdiction they find themselves in, in an emer during an emergency if they can't report to their normal work situation. This type of agreement is only triggered under limited and specific circumstances when skilled workers are unable to report to their normal work location, jurisdiction, or jurisdiction during an emergency and when their receiving agency lacks bandwidth and capacity and welcomes the assistance. Mark Fetters, BDS supervisor, Matt Rozelle, the city's building official, and Dr. Ann Castleton, the emergency manager and project lead from BDS, will present this ordinance. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Mark Fetters, and I am the supervisor for BDS's uh, safety emergency management and facilities programs. And we're happy to bring this ordinance to you this afternoon. Um, just for a bit of context, back in 2014, the city council authorized a similar stranded worker agreement with the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, or RDPO for the sharing of emergency operations center workers. And that's in your packet labeled exhibit B, that ordinance. This ordinance that we're bringing to you today covers other types of workers that are also important in, in an emergency or disaster situation. Um, many of the government agencies that are located in the region that the RDPO covers, the five county region, um, employ building officials, inspectors, plans examiners, engineers and architects who have professional certifications and qualify as building safety evaluators. These are the folks who in a disaster can do rapid damage assessment of structures, which is a critical function um, in responding to be it an earthquake or other major disaster. Those agencies also employ other types of staff who are related to building permitting processes. So folks who are involved in permitting, permitting software, facility maintenance. And those folks are also important in responding to a significant disaster. We know that the Pacific Northwest is prone to a variety of natural disasters from earthquakes to floods to wildfires, snow and ice storms. We've experienced all that. And when those hazards occur, it can have significant impacts on transportation routes. Um, it can cut off power and communications. And the result of that is that you have workers who are qualified to, to whether it's doing damage assessments or supporting uh, uh, building related functions in an emergency, those workers end up being stranded in the locations where they are and unable to report to their normal work locations. So you might have a building inspector from Washington County who lives in Southeast Portland. They might not be able to get to Washington County to do damage assessment, but possibly they could report in Portland where they are and do damage assessment here rather than just being idled. And that's what this ordinance is attempting to address. And I'll turn it over to uh, Matt Rizal to give you more information. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, for the record, my name is Matt Rizal. Uh, BDS is responsible for assessing the safety of this, uh, the city's buildings. We have more than 206,000 buildings in the city. Um, after an earthquake such as the Cascadia subduction zone, we would need to go out and evaluate all of those buildings. Um, BDS has about 150 qualified staff who can go out and evaluate buildings and determine whether they can be um, re-entered or reoccupied. Um, estimating, you know, 35 to 45 minutes per building for the initial safety evaluation and assuming we have the 150 staff available to do those assessments. Um, and also <laughs> um, that there are no aftershocks that would require us to start over. Um, our best case scenario is that it would take about 20 weeks to evaluate all the buildings in the city of Portland. So I will hand that, hand it over to Ann. Hello, um, hello all. Uh, well, I realize that we're standing between you and lunch. Um, and I, my name for the record is Ann Castleton. Um, I just wanted to say of those, um, that 20 weeks that Matt just mentioned, um, it, it, you can imagine what the impact is on business if they have to wait 20 weeks to get back into their buildings, uh, to have access to their buildings. And 
one of the biggest challenges for us after the earthquake is going to be the economic recovery of the city and trying to get people to stay here. And in a situation like this, oftentimes people leave and don't ever return. So uh, the bad news is that when we looked, we used the Everbridge system to look at where all of our 150 inspectors live, I would say 40 to 50% live out of town. They're outside Portland boundaries. So that's an even more bigger limitation. But we also know that there's an, un, I don't know how many, but other folks live in our um, city boundaries and would be able to help us. So uh, I'm sure you're aware that the expectation is that transportation routes and bridges are going to be disrupted, that communication might be disrupted. And so people are not going to be able to report to their ordinary duty station. So this um, stranded worker agreement is really just trying to address that situation, which is really only would happen probably after an earthquake and it would only really be relevant for those first few weeks before the bridges are repaired and that people are getting around. So with this agreement in place, um, these folks that live in our city limits could participate and support us in our building evaluations. So by signing this agreement, it would allow us to both to provide our staff to others where they live and to accept staff that are credentialed to help us get through this process quickly. So that's all um, that we have, Commissioner Rubio. Great. Thank you, uh, Mark, Matt, and Ann for your presentation. Yeah, thanks. This is a great idea. Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Any further discussion? I just have Commissioner one. Gonzalez, you bet. <laughs> just one request. Um, <coughs> I just want to make sure that there's coordination with uh, Director Ahmed uh, at PBAM on this. I think there was a little bit of a question mark when this came through, uh, whether PBAM had been able to weigh in on it. So that, that's just a request between uh, today and second reading. Um, if, if there could be a touch base there. I don't see anything controversial here. Just want to make sure we're coordinated internally. Um, this is, could I just say that this is uh, from the RDPO and um, Ahmed, uh, Director Ahmed is the boss, the mm -hmm. host of RDPO. So um, I would assume that the RDPO and um, Ahmed have had a discussion about this. Yeah, I think there was just, it, it, it may not be that that's occurred. So I just want to make sure that we're, when okay. this came through, it was, there was just a little bit of a question mark on it. So, um, if, if someone could reach out to him, that would be great um, uh, be, between next. I will do that. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Maps. Sure. Um, this looks like a good idea to me, and I think my brain probably went in some of the same spaces that Commissioner Gonzalez uh, um, pointed to. Um, I hadn't really thought about uh, BDS's role in disaster re recovery very deeply. Uh, great to learn more about that and great to see that uh, folks are um, planning for um, the inevitable. Um, um, I, ha I do have some, I do wonder how, um, especially in this space, how, uh, I'm going to make this a statement as a more than a question, so we can get on to the other things on our agenda. Um, be great to see coordination with uh, PBIM um, around this. I don't know if those conversations already happened. And I do have one quick question, um, especially does BDS have a relationship with FEMA? It certainly seems with some of this stuff that FEMA would be um, on the ground in the, in the um, event of an earthquake. I'm not sure who owns this space or what planning. Anne, is that is that your hand up? Yeah. Um, so FEMA, th this this agreement really would be for a very concentrated period of time before FEMA gets here. FEMA thinks they won't get here for a couple of weeks. So, um, and FEMA doesn't ever take, they don't usurp responsibility from the authority having jurisdiction, which is BDS for, for buildings. So this agreement, the RDPO is five counties. So it's Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington, Clark, Columbia. It's all those five counties. So all of the counties are signing, are working on this agreement and all of the municipalities within this agreement, uh, within that region so that we can all share folks. So FEMA would, and so they're all kind of working on this also and are looking to see what Portland does. Um, 
Uh, but FEMA probably doesn't come in at that point. FEMA comes in in a broader damage assessments, but not the building related. That's really under Matt as our building official. Um, it would be responsible for that. They will do overall damage assessments of like, is it enough that we declare a national emergency and start sending in the troops? Uh, I, and thank you so much for that clarification. I learned some stuff there. Um, I have no more questions. Very good. And Commissioner Gonzalez, did you have another question or nope. is that? Get that in All right, very good. Uh, and I already asked about public testimony. I think there was none. There's none. All right, very good. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Now to the items on the consent agenda that were pulled. Item number 404, please. Update resolution connecting mental health and substance abuse recovery services to unhoused individuals. Colleagues, item 404 is an update to resolution 37595 of the five resolution package that Commissioner Ryan and I introduced and that the City Council passed back in November of 2022. That resolution created the temporary alternative shelter sites that will connect unsheltered Portlanders with mental health and substance abuse recovery services, as well as access to housing placements. This update to that resolution allows for a maximum of 200 individuals at a temporary alternative shelter site. Governor Kotek, in her executive order, all in plan for the state, included funding for 140 pod units for the first site as well as funding for six months of operating expenses. Of those 140 pods, 35 of them can accommodate pairs or couples. So there may be more than 150 people on site when fully occupied. For this reason, I'm moving to update the resolution to a maximum of 200 individuals to accommodate these pods from Governor Kotek. I wanna thank Governor Kotek for funding these pods as well as the operating expenses and in believing that temporary alternative shelter sites are a necessary part of our larger continuum of care. Together, we will help get unsheltered Portlanders off the streets and connected to the services that they so desperately need. I don't know who pulled this and whether they have specific issues they want addressed. Uh, it was pulled by Josie Kressner. Is Josie here or online? Great, come on, uh, three minutes please for your public testimony. And if you could just introduce yourself for the yep. record, please. Thank you for the time to speak, uh, Mayor Wheeler and, and Council. Thank you. It's a marathon of a session. You guys run <laughs> on Wednesdays. So uh, thank you again for the time. Hi, my name is Josie Kressner. I have a PhD in transportation engineering. I'm a local business owner um, working in data science and city planning. And I am a homeowner <clears throat> with a 10-month-old uh, immediately outside the 100 thousand foot uh, perimeter, the Clinton Triangle Gideon site. I'm also on the board of the Osbord Abernathy Neighborhood Association and also participating in the working group with the city on the Good Neighbor Agreement. Um, the following comments I want to emphasize are my own and have not been discussed um, by the Neighborhood Association board. Um, <clears throat> but in my opinion, both the Osbord Abernathy and Brooklyn neighborhoods along with Central East Side have been working in good faith with the city to set this shelter site up for everyone involved to be successful. And we're doing our best to curtail, obviously, any um, nimbyism, even with this extreme situation. However, um, this resolution here, among other acts um, by the city and county, indicates to me that the city is playing a little bit fast and loose with the solution. Um, and I say that because this first site resides according to census data in a block group where approximately one in five are minors. Majority of those minors are zero to nine years old. This age group in this small collection of city blocks is 20% higher than the average rate in the city as a whole and 10% higher than the whole county. Just to be extra clear, this means that the immediate area around the camp has 20% more zero to nine year olds than the average neighborhood in the city. <clears throat> it's in this neighborhood with 20% more young children that you've chosen to build your proof of concept or experiment. The difference on paper between 150 or 200 or 250 seems trivial, but <clears throat> to the people living here, that number is huge, it's enormous. 
How does one living in a shelter of 250 people feel a sense of responsibility or ownership to the community inside the shelter as well as to the neighborhood outside? Please consider removing or keeping, sorry, please consider keeping the original number of persons in place until the city has proven that this model is safe enough for the safe enough on the ground for the children who live here in Portland. Where, where, what, I have 30 seconds at this point, where measure 110 has made things different than, for example, LA, San Francisco, and Austin. I do not request, um, I do not make this request as a gatekeeper of the neighborhood, and in fact, I'm not here to oppose the solution. I amend you, commend you for making change because we need to see change but rather as a person concerned about the ability of the city and county to scale up all the services required at the site for everyone involved in time. Thank you. Um, and first of all, thank you for your patience. You've been sitting here hour after hour. We're, we're into our fifth hour of, of council and you've been sitting here patiently throughout most of it. I want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. The good news is it's actually a pretty interesting council session. We covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Um, I want to acknowledge that, that what you're saying is accurate in terms of um, the concerns that you're expressing are very legitimate concerns. And they are the same concerns that I have had and my staff has had. I will also tell you, I believe we have adequately addressed those concerns. Um, we will not go full bore until we feel confident that we have a model that works and in fact, the service provider is now operating one of our smaller safe rest villages in a different part of the city. And so we're also evaluating their progress there. Part of the core difference between this strategy and other strategies we've used is the intensity with which it will be managed. It's one to 15, uh, one personnel per 15 individuals as opposed to what's more typical, which is one to 40 or even one to 100. So there is more intensive oversight and management of what's going on in this facility. The difference here is really the pods. Some of the pods, uh, as, as I indicated in my sort of uh, brief introduction here, could, and I underscore could, accommodate couples. And so it may be that, that we still have 140 or it could be potentially more if they happen to be couples occupying those pods. So there, there's a little bit of flexibility here that we're trying to bring into the model. And because we agreed that there would be an original cap, that's that's why we're here today. And I, I don't know if, uh, Sky, you have something more to add to that. Or if you want to retract anything I said that wasn't accurate. Thank you. Colleagues, I don't know if anybody else has a thought or a concern. So um, obviously this first site is critically important to our success. If we botch the first site, if the neighbors are unhappy or they don't feel that they're safe or they don't feel we've lived up to our end of the bargain with regard to maintaining the perimeters, uh, the rest of the sites won't work. So uh, well, here, we, I, we know we're going to be watched very, very closely. I think as. We, I know you guys are, are doing your best and it really, you know, the first site is both a positive and a negative, but I think where I'm, as a participant in the working group, not getting a good enough answer yet is immediately outside that thousand foot perimeter zone one, where we go, there's a lot of ideas and services and phone numbers to call for different issues, but there's not a clear site on where the solution is gonna come when there's somebody shooting up a needle in front of you know, XYZ place in that area. And we, we know that, that <clears throat> up to 250 people at a very close proximity are likely having substance abuse problems. It's going to be an issue and Measure 110 is, as we all know, making it difficult. And it just seems like I know you can't commit to keeping that number down for other reasons. There's money that became available, we can't turn it away, but at the same time it doesn't feel like 
there's enough being done about that immediate area. There's not enough resources, and I it, I know you're fighting for it. There's you know measure 411 is is here, but I don't want to put the cart before the horse. We're not saying don't do it here. We're just saying like hey we you know measure 110 passed before there was a lot of things in place that needed to be in place and clearly <laughs> yeah I know and so I don't want we're you know we we. I think I forgot, I didn't know if I even read this last sentence, but we don't want to be, our young children in the neighborhood and our families don't want to be the collateral damage on this one. Yeah, and, and, I, and I agree. And, and just FYI, um, the neighborhood number will go directly to the service provider and we will get regular updates and accountability on that. And I have personally pledged that if there's issues outside of the thousand foot perimeter, we will address those as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we have, it, the, the problem is it's every square block of the city at the, the moment. I recognize that. And so actually, that actually that, the intensive efforts will be around the temporary alternative shelter sites. And that's, that's what I've been telling people. You know, we're, we're going to focus our resources in the vicinity of those temporary alternative shelter sites. And we acknowledge that there's trouble spots that have been identified by the neighborhood that are beyond that thousand foot perimeter. Uh, the schools, the, the safe routes to schools, there's some overpasses that are of concern to some residents in the neighborhood, and, and we've committed to addressing those sites as well. But anyway, I appreciate what you're saying. We, we have to do something, though. We have, we have to move forward to address this problem, and, and this is our best shot from my perspective. Any further discussion? Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to say I appreciate your commentary. I, um, I actually appreciate your, I, I'm going to use the word pessimism, but I say that without judgment, that um, we've heard many promises from public players uh, on behavioral health, including on Measure 110. Um, we've seen a number of statements around uh, the support of families and of young children in our community. And we've consistently seen behaviors that are inconsistent with those statements. So I would encourage you to continue to be fierce in advocating for children in the city of Portland. I would encourage you to continue to question every level of government in the state when it says we are family friendly, that we are committed to protecting children's ability to in the city. Um, on this particular issue right now, I have a level of deference to the mayor but please hold us accountable. And um, I wish I could say we're always going to keep our promises as a city. I, I, I was on the outside before and witnessed some of those promises that weren't kept. And now I'm on the inside and trying to help make sure that we do keep our promises. Um, I, so I don't know if that helps. I'm going to have a staff member talk to you about something else in your neighborhood that's somewhat related. We do have some good news on the public safety. Um, front that uh, may be coming to your neighborhood soon. It does not directly responsive to the issue you're raising here, but I just want to say thank you for testifying. Parents absolutely have to speak up in this city and in this community, um, and you can trust, but 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 you have to verify. And uh, I've heard a lot of empty promises in my years, particularly the last five uh, in the city of Portland, with respect to families and parents. And please keep speaking up. I will make a further commitment. If it doesn't work, I'll stand down. This is that important to me, that we, ha we have to address this crisis on our streets. We have to, the viability of the city is at stake. And this is my best shot. This is the best shot my team and I can give. And if this doesn't work, I'll turn it over to somebody else for a different strategy. But I'm 100% confident it will, that we have the right combination, that we're filling the right gaps, that we're meeting the needs of people that are currently unmet, because you're right. Uh, I agree with you that it's, it's not, and I've been saying this for years, often to my political detriment, that it's not just about the housing, that there are people who are struggling with behavioral health issues, there are people struggling with substance use disorder issues, there are people who are not getting access to basic health care, that e despite myriads of outreach efforts, we're not reaching people, so we have to consolidate the services and bring people to where those services are. And I've also been equally fervent in my belief 
that we have to address the public health, the public safety, and the livability issues caused to the whole community by unsanctioned homeless camps. And to me, this is the right strategy. And I'm that confident, and I, you don't have to take that to the bank. Um, I mean, I'm this, not disagreeing with your approach. Uh, I just want to make sure that, yeah. yeah. No, I, and, yeah. And, I, and I actually I enjoy this, and I appreciate your background, by the way, because you mentioned that you're in data analysis, data management, and we live and die on that, right? Those are the results. Um, but this is our best shot. And I'm six and a half years into this. Commissioner Gonzalez just said for five years he's heard promises broken. I hope he hasn't heard me break my promises. Uh, but I have a vision for this city that does not include the human carnage that we're seeing on our streets. My vision for this city is very, very different. And I'm dedicating my life to ensure that this works. That's how, how much I'm putting into this. But I, I'm hearing you as a parent. I'm hearing you as a neighbor. Uh, and I appreciate what you're saying. And I, I hope I can address those concerns, allay those concerns by showing you that this program works. That's my, my expectation. And my whole team is dedicated to that notion. I believe you all. I just recognize that it's hard to move this many people and this many programs in, you know, programs that are separated and hard to communicate between. I and have so climbed takes mountains time. <laughs> that make this, like, Mount Everest was nothing compared to this. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're collectively up to the challenge, right? I mean, we're, we, we want to do this and we want to do right by you and want, we want to do right by the rest of the community. And so I, I feel a personal commitment to you, to be perfectly honest with you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The resolution is adopted. And to our last item this morning before we go into our afternoon session, item 406 also pulled. And it's uh, for a proposed amendment that we have to add. Authorize grant agreement with Legacy Health for FY 2022 through 23 to renovate the Unity Health, Unity Center for Behavioral Health Psychiatric Emergency Service Space to expand capacity for crisis triage and add eight sobering beds slash recliners, not to exceed $335,000. Colleagues, I almost hate to waste your time with this, but we have been informed that there will be nine sobering bed recliners rather than eight, which was specified in the original ordinance. Uh, I move to amend the ordinance to update eight sobering bed recliners to nine. Can I second. please get a second? We second. have a second from Commissioner Ryan. Any further discussion on this important matter, Commissioner? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say if there's a mistake to be made, this is a great one. I'm glad to expand exactly. the, you know, I think that we could do a factor of 10 here and uh, be in the ballpark of where we want to be. Uh, worth the wait. Very good. Uh, is there anyone signed up for public testimony on this matter? No one signed up. Good. I was hoping nobody would lambast me for my, uh, my addition area. Or please call the roll. Brian. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I'm an eye on this, and I'm really glad to see uh, these beds in place. Uh, this is a critically important unmet need in our community. I think we have nine beds here. I think we're told that it would be good to have about another 40 more. Um, uh, and that's my goal, and I look forward to working with this council to get those additional beds online. I vote aye. Rubio. Aye. R Wheeler. I vote aye. Uh, colleagues, given the lateness of the hour, I would propose we... What? Oh, you're right. Thank you. Sorry. That was the amendment. The amendment was adopted uh, to the main motion is amended. Please call the roll. Ryan. Yeah, we, let, we closed our last sobering station in 2018. Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership to move this forward. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Badly needed. We need many, many more bed, space, uh, bed spaces. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted and the uh, motion passes as amended. Uh, colleagues, uh, we've now been meeting for the better part of five hours. I would recommend we take at least 20 minutes for lunch and reconvene at 2.15 p.m. That'll give us an opportunity to reset. It'll give staff the opportunity to take a breather before we go into what could be a long afternoon session. 2.30 start. What? 2.30. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. We will reconvene at 2.30. We're adjourned.